This Week in Parasitism is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at microbeworld.org slash twip. This Week in Parasitism, episode number 88, recorded on April 29th, 2015. This episode is sponsored by SciMed Solutions, a leader in cutting-edge software products in science and medicine. From EKG management to sequence analysis, the software built by SciMed helps researchers and organizations increase their throughput by orders of magnitude, letting them get results more accurately and efficiently. SIMED has years of experience working with scientists in areas like immunology, virology, and genetics. If you're attending this year's conference for the American Association of Immunologists, it's in New Orleans, stop by to say hello in the exhibition hall, learn about what SIMED can do for you, and see their new product designed for life scientists. SIMED software and consulting services will let you automate repetitive analysis and reporting of large data sets, streamlining experiments, and maintaining data integrity. You should contact them about their research partnerships, database setup, mobile apps, and web applications. You can find more at scimedsolutions.com. SciMed Solutions, innovative software empowering the world's leading minds. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to TWIP. It's not a podcast about viruses. No. It's all about parasites. Yes, it is. I don't have any tagline for the beginning of TWIP, do uh, I? Well, we could come up with something. Uh, see you at the vertical farm? No, that's, no, the that's another one. <laughs> How about parasites that make you sick? Parasites that make you Podcast sick. Podcast all about parasites <laughs> that make you sick. The parasites, the ones that make you that's sick. Right. The ones with true nuclei. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can hear who's with me today, right here in the TWIP studio, Dixon de Palmier. Yeah, I'm right here. Hello, Vince. Dixon. Yeah. Nice day, isn't it's it? It's a gorgeous day. In fact, it may be the best day of the year so far. It's going to hit 70 degrees it's, out there. Uh, There's a light cloud cover. The sun is shining. The, the, the flowers are out. Each day is the best day. Isn't that a philosophy? Well, if you wake up thing? and you're alive, the answer is yeah, yes. It's 19C already. It's sunny. Yeah. No, it's going to be, in terms of human comfort zone, mm. I think this will be the best day on the East Coast so far. Also joining us today is Daniel Griffin. Welcome back. Oh, it's always good to be here. And, and, uh, you've got a, work, a week of work after vacation under your belt, right? Yes, yes. It's, Have you uh, forgotten your vacation? Uh, I'm actually, when I was, what, what is the best day of the spring? It was probably one of those days I spent in England. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, boy, it looks nice out there, but that was very, that was very fun. That was a nice mm. trip. Mm. Well, back to work. Parasites. Yep. We had a few responses to last time's uh, case let's see we had one two three four five six six not bad no everyone except one guessed the same thing okay is there anything we need to do i always forget before i tell you know, <laughs> yeah let me let me remind everyone okay. of the case Thank you. um i mean i guess we assume that everyone listens to every single uh, twip <laughs> in order but <laughs> i was just word. thinking somebody may tune in and have not heard the last twip this so before we true. read the emails they may want to know like what are we talking about right we had presented last um twip session a 69 year old um gentleman of italian <clears throat> descent who likes to go back to Italy um, every year for about a month. And he had returned um, from his last visit. And again, his trip was a, a month long, and it had been a month since he got back. And he was reporting a lesion on his arm, which started off with a bump um, and then had actually become an ulcer. And he had reported mosquito right. bites. And so it looks like we have a lot of emails with people uh, yeah. conjecturing yeah. about what it might be. Robin says cutaneous leishmaniasis this has been endemic in Italy since the 70s in the same areas as visceral leishmaniasis, largely underreported to the Ministry of Health. Christine uh, writes, um, cutaneous leishmaniasis, this would have been transmitted by the bite of a sand fly, would be worth sampling the edge of the lesion. 
Christine's in Brisbane, where she's had beautiful blue skies, fresh <laughs> westerly winds, and a high of 25 C. That's a gorgeous city. I've been there, and it, it's, it can be quite beautiful. Wink. On the Morton River. Wink, our physician from Atlanta. If this is leishmaniasis, my question for Dixon is, where do sand flies live? Beach, desert, grass? Uh, Bjorn. We'll get back to that one. Cutaneous leishmaniasis. Not that common in Italy, but... Certainly not unheard of, a bite of a sand fly. And he goes into a few diagnostic possibilities. All of this is fresh off my notes from the wonderful Coursera course in tropical parasitology. Nice. As a software engineer, I don't know much about parasites, but what little I do know comes from This Week in Parasitism <laughs> and that single Coursera course. Parasites are fascinating. Keep Keep it up, doctors. You are an inspiration. Hmm. Elise, our friend from Lower Manhattan, <laughs> writes, how are you? How are we? We're, We're good. good. Right? We're good. <laughs> Many thanks again for your case studies. I love working on these and was not even mortified, remotely mortified, by not getting the answer <laughs> to 86. I never would have guessed pinworms. And that oh. is a sentence I am glad I have never had an opportunity to compose prior to today. <laughs> oh. I'm not sure we actually concluded that pinworms were the culprit. It was a confounding yeah. uh, finding that... Uh, they were found, but... They were found, but right. did they cause the actual syndrome that that kid was suffering from? And we're so still she, talking so about that. She guesses way. cutaneous leishmaniasis, southern yeah. Italy, beach, sand flies. Um, Elise is a great researcher. We should actually get her to do research for us. <laughs> she, she obviously finds all this online. And yeah, she's very good, good at stuff. Sorting good it stuff. all out. Yeah. I should also add that the glee with which all of you introduced the description of the symptoms <clears throat> made me think this would probably be a less subtle problem. <laughs> 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 yes, we had glee. <laughs> Permanent scarring. Would it possibly to minimize the scarring if the diagnosis is made sooner? We'll come back to that. Right. Uh, the weather in Lower Manhattan is 20 degrees C and skies are blue. Wow. Scott. Oh, th this is a different one, I think. Scott, uh -huh. this is from Coastal. He refers to us as gentlemen. Is that, yeah, that's, well, that's that, right away. That he must be a new nice. listener. <laughs> he must Scott's be a brand from, new listener. It's from Costa Rica, where people are nice to each other. <coughs> Here in Manhattan, we're not nice. Yeah, Costa Rica's a good place. <laughs> a long I think Elise is very nice, right? She's that's true. She's nice very us, nice. So. And she's from Manhattan. So. Maybe she's... Uh, um, <laughs> She's not from Manhattan, what do you Kansas, call by it any when chance, right? <laughs> fooling you about where they're from. There's a name for that, right? A word for that? Uh, I forgot. Anyway, you know, on the internet, no one knows you're a dog, right? So oh, no one, she could know. be from yeah. Kansas. That's true. But I'm sure That's she's true. from Manhattan. Yeah. Uh, as a longtime listener, I have enjoyed your case presentations. And as I have no competence as a diagnostician, I've enjoyed speculating. Case in the t current TWIP struck a chord. Living here in Costa Rica, where my myiasis caused by dermatobia hominis is fairly right, common. Right. Presentation sounded actually quite familiar. I can't speculate as to the species or flies, but that's what he thinks it is. Somewhere I heard a story about a biologist who was infested here and decided to let nature take its course once he got back <laughs> home so he could document the development of the larvae uh. to the emerging stage. As I recall, it got too painful to tolerate, and he had to remove it prior to emergence. But even yeah. so, doing such a thing strikes me as being truly heroic dedication to science. <laughs> I was infested with one once and removed it as soon as I discovered it. I can uh. testify that it was yeah. painful even when still quite small. Dermatobia. Did we ever talk about dermatobia? Yeah, we did that once. Mm. Did we you did leave it once. in your arm when you got it? I never got it. <laughs> okay. No, I've never been to the beaches of Costa Rica, so I haven't uh, really done that. So that's but, it. That's the one who yeah. was different. And I, I will warn you that even though this, I will say, is not that, I do I do have a case that I will, will present in the future <laughs> with uh, cool. my ISS. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I want to address one of the comments that was made by the first uh, responder that the uh, presence of cutaneous leishmaniasis has been common since the 1970s. So you'd have to ask, well, then, what about before that? And if you look before World War II, it was extremely common in Italy, as was malaria. And then something happened, and what do you suppose that was, Vincent? Mosquito control during the war. Go on. With? How D did they control DDT. it? DDT. Yeah, well, they, did, they controlled other things with DDT, mm -hmm. too, right? Like epidemic typhus. Mm -hmm. And they used to actually, with flit containers of DDT, put this down the back of the troops' uniforms as they came off the boats. Mm. And Anzio, 
which was where the U.S. the Allied troops reinvaded Italy mm -hmm. through Anzio, as you'll recall in yep. your World War II histories, and uh, because they uh, DDT'd the troops, they did not catch epidemic typhus because they killed the lice. Whereas the right. the Italians were no longer in the war, but that by that point the Germans were only in the war, right? And they got lots of epidemic typhus. So just after the war, they decided to get rid of all the malaria. Because <clears throat> that was a big problem there, even during the war. So they DDT'd the entire country. They DDT'd the entire Mediterranean basin, thinking mm -hmm. this is a panacea. We're going to get rid of all of it. So you can imagine what happened. They got rid of malaria for a while. Then what happened? The mosquitoes became resistant to the DDT, <laughs> and it all came back. But guess what yeah. else they got rid of when they sprayed for mosquitoes? Sand flies? Got it. So... Hmm. Cutaneous leishmaniasis fell Went off down. the cliff. It just disappeared. Huh. So it's come back too because the sand sure. flies have now come back. There you go. Yeah. So it's an interesting story when you look at the history of the world and diseases at the same time. So what clinched <coughs> this diagnosis, Daniel? Well, th this will be good. So ev everyone, almost everyone except for the one person, thinks that this <laughs> is leash. Do you guys think it's leash? Uh, yeah, we did last time. You, you thought it was Ishmaelis. <laughs> Vince points to his arm and he goes like this. You know, yeah. seeing we had eye contact. Well, I made we, the L. I did. He made the, the L. You made he the L. He made the L, L sign. I, I thought he was just dissing Dixon here, but uh, <laughs> I guess the L was for Ishmaelis. He was going to take a picture <laughs> with his cell phone. But you're right. I, I thought the same thing actually. No, and I, and I, I chose this case um, specifically because yes, I thought, you know, there's a lot of cases. I've seen actually a lot of cases of Ishmaelis. It's um, becoming more common, particularly we could thank our Costa Rican writer. Um, it's actually quite common, people coming back from Costa Rica with leishmaniasis, and we actually see a few a year just from Costa Rica. But the way they describe the ulcer, so we start off with the clinically. You know, he, he's been in an area where this might occur, and, and what is the skin manifestation? <coughs> and, and I hope I described it well. Um, I described it as an ulcer, and that helped bring us um, away from a... Um, ectoparasite burrowing into the skin or inserting something into the skin to the idea that it's some sort of an, an ulcer on the skin. The next was the fact that um, it was not painful. Right. So there was no pain. That's but, right. But, and that's also a distinction. There's no pain, but there's mm. also not a lack of feeling. He wasn't describing right. that, oh, it doesn't hurt and I can't feel in that right. area. That right. lack of sensory might make us think of other things, which may or may not like, end up on TWIP. But uh, the other is then looking at the edge of the ulcer. So a lot of this you can, and actually, you know, in the world, in much of the world, outside the United States, outside of the developed West, let's say, the developing world, I guess that's an optimistic concept. We <laughs> hope they're developing. Um, in those areas, a lot of this will be clinical without, we're going to actually have some um, microscopic confirmation. But you look really closely at these ulcers, and you'll see that there's a raised border, but that right. it's not undermined. So there's just kind of an edge. It's a little bit raised. And then what does the, the lesion, the base of the lesion look like? It looks like a pizza pie. It's often <laughs> described as the pizza pie lesion. So I thought, isn't this great? A man from Italy with the pizza pie lesion on his arm. Oh, yes. It's and, also referred uh, to as crater form, by the way. <laughs> now, <laughs> if you're an astronomer. Every time I see a pizza now, I'm going to think of You're going to think of... Uh, <laughs> no, yeah. With or without... You know, <laughs> with or without Lishmania on my pizza. Uh, um, you know, often they'll have a fibrous coating. Um, often they'll actually have, you know, really a... Wait, I see Dixon about to want to say something. No, you're going to finish first. No, I, no, I don't you, want to you, interrupt you. Okay, often you'll see it. I'll actually look pretty bad even though it's just leishmaniasis but often they will get super infected as well well i was going to add that because i've i've seen a lot of them also because they used to come into the parasite clinic on the corner where i used to work as a technician and then later on we had a person in our laboratory actually working with uh leishmania mexicana which is uh, the one that you would probably catch in costa rica <clears throat> but um we had a technician in our laboratory, her name was Susie. I won't give you her last name because we reserve those for privacy's sake. Who accidentally, <coughs> one day, while trying to inject mice with Leishmania mexicana, instead injected Susie <laughs> right into her forefinger. And so everyone was, we got very excited about this because now we can watch the lesion develop. And we could also <laughs> ask her. <clears throat> whether she was willing to allow this to go to a point where it resembled all the typical crater form lesions that 
people would come back, let's say an oil executive would go to the Middle East, for instance, in the 60s, this was very common, and they would come back with cutaneous leishmaniasis due to another species, of course, but it didn't matter. So, so in this case, Susie was totally on board for this. So for months, we watched this crater form lesion develop on the, uh, the last uh, segment of her index finger. It took months? It did. It took months. And wow. then she decided that she wanted to get rid of it. <laughs> so we photographed the hell out of this thing during the time that she had it. There was no danger of it spreading systemically, thank goodness, because it was not uh, visceral leishmaniasis. This was just cutaneous. So, Wait, all right. What do you mean? It was a different organism? Actually, uh, this, will, this will be good. Yeah, this is actually important. And I think this it's is very important because there are, there are three different kinds of leishmania and... And two of them are found in the New World, and, and two of them are found in the um, Old World, so to speak. And one is visceral, and one is cutaneous. So the cutaneous form is the one that you hope you get, because if you don't, then you can get a more serious form of leishmaniasis. And we did cover this in the, the early uh, episodes of this uh, uh, podcast. So the point is that Susie wanted to get cured now. So what did you do? Ah, well, we, wanted, we decided on two approaches. You the first, her, you cut her finger off. Well, that was one. <laughs> <laughs> she opted out of that clinical protocol. So we we opted for two more tries. One is without drugs, and one is with drugs. Mm -hmm. So it's on your finger, right? So, so one of the things that you could do, you could suggest doing at least, was to submerge your finger in very hot water, just at the point of of not being able to stand it almost, but you could tolerate it for short periods of time to try to kill the organisms with heat, which led, by the way, to a series of experiments on heat shock genes because <clears throat> these organisms didn't die that way. Hmm. That's too bad. It, it, it arrested their growth rate, but it did not stop them from living. And so then the other was, of course, to try a um, chemical of some sort, a drug, so what drug would you pick? Well, there's a drug. It's a very serious drug. It's got antimony in it, and that's not a good drug. It's got heavy metals. Nobody <laughs> wants that one. But there was another one. Ivermectin? Right? No, not no. that's for worms. Albendazole? No, that's also for worms. <laughs> but keep going. You've got a long list to go through, Vincent. <laughs> ketoconazole. ketoconazole. It's an antifungal agent. But it turns out that ketoconazole works very well for cutaneous leishmaniasis. Does the physician agree with that? Yeah, no. Um, <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah, no. Yeah, no. Well, she opted for that, and it actually did eventually cure her. Yeah, infection. no. Well, late, later on, we should talk about. I, I, I was, yeah, I was enjoying your discussion of the the heat, which is actually interesting. Uh, you know, yeah, not everywhere yeah. in the world has access to to the drugs. Um, this is true. Uh, to treat these, and so they they have found that. Really, warm water does arrest the um, replication of this. It did. It doesn't kill it, and, that, and that's right. a problem that we'll come up with when we talk more about treatment. You don't actually clear completely from your system leishmaniasis right. like um, in most cases. That's right. You've arrested development. You can see the the ulcers heal, but often if you're going to just do the hot water, it might come back. This and is what true. you're describing sounds like there's there's several manifestations of leishmaniasis but l let me first we'll clinch this diagnosis right and then yes. we'll then we'll go ahead and we'll discuss sure. those. can we talk about which cell types are infected sure because sure. these are not squamous yeah. cell types that, these, that they, is they true. do not infect skin cells so these parasites go within the cells they do they're intracellular parasites mm -hmm. and they and they like well they like see we're anthropomorphizing <laughs> again uh, they they like getting inside they, of macrophages they, they have a trophism <laughs> so there's a connection between the research paper that we're about to get to and this case that's why i mentioned oh it'll that. be a long time before we get to the research yeah. <laughs> yeah. Leash, leash maniasis is great all stuff. right so we've got this and and in this so what it, cell it, type in, is in, it in this case you have um a bunch of different ways of really confirming the diagnosis and, right and the goal is to actually see the parasite that's a great way to confirm it you could do that and um there's a couple different ways the the edge of the lesion is where these um parasites are concentrated yes so you can you can scrape and then smear that on a slide you can put a needle and aspirate you, could do that. you can do a biopsy where you, you get the histopathology and in, in this case the person had a punch biopsy right and when you look at the punch biopsy um and the great thing about the punch biopsy is you get a nice staining and everything by you your do, you you do. Know, dermatopathologist no, di no distortions and you can actually see these 
probably about two microns in diameter inside of the macrophages. Correct. You see these, the amastigote stage. There you go. And what ends up happening, and I think some of our um, emailers um, were referring to this, is you get a bite by a sand fly, and in the sand fly saliva are these amastigotes, which will invade the macrophages. Right. Um, <laughs> go ahead. You, no, you're, they're not amastigotes at that point. Tell me. pro mastigotes pro mastigotes They're pro mastigotes mm. They're okay. actually flagellated forms of the parasite. That's true. That's true. Thank you. So they end up, yes. <laughs> well, I'm a parasitologist on call. You're a physician on call. What a great combination. That, that is true. And I was going to, you know, and I, you know and, I, and I always have to like come up with memory tricks for these things. Like what's a pro and what's an A and yeah, then does yeah, it become yeah, yeah, a yeah, full-fledged. Yeah, right. But, you know, how do you, what is a mast? What do we call it? It's just, you know, I'm a sailor. So I think the mast is really this long thing. We call it a flagella if it's a protozoan and a mast that holds up your sail so. on a boat. So these are a mastigotes without a mast, without a flagella or Mastigotes with uh, or so pro mastigotes. Mastigophora is the general uh, phylum for flagellated protozoa of yeah. all species. Mm. So trypanosomes are part of that group because they're called hemoflagellates, and these are called flagellated forms also in the sandfly vector only. And then they transform after they're taken up by. Take it, Daniel. No, anyway. <laughs> so what, no, anyway, when the sandfly bites, what cells actually take these organisms up? So once the sandfly bites, they actually end up inside the macrophages. No, that's, I would... Okay, go. Base, no, base the, well, I'm not disagreeing with you, <laughs> ultimately. But if you're going to consider a dendritic cell... Are you going to talk about the histiocyte? So initially the histiocytes the can be involved, cells, yeah. Because yeah. that's an important... So histiocyte is, is another name for a dendritic cell? Um, there's there's different forms of dendritic cells in different areas, right? Yeah, so you've got your Langerhans, Langerhans cells, your histiocytes. Right. This um, is a Langerhans cell. Yeah, so this is That's right. in the skin. Um, That's right. But the real replication, right? So, so we're, we're getting into in, into really subtle details, which is okay. Right. Which is okay. So, this is all good because um, we're discussing immune cells, and that always makes right. me happy. So we should also um, discuss at the same time then the aiding and abetting material that the sand fly injects into the bite wound at the same time, mm -hmm. it's trying to take blood from its host, right? So it You're the host. Coagulants in. It's got tons of stuff in there. I mean, it's got right? incredible amounts of everything. And it, Many years ago, that's what you called it. <laughs> a pharmacopoeia, remember? Yeah, it's a, yes. it's, a, it's a flying syringe of pharmacopoeias. That's correct. Mm -hmm. And so there are lots of substances that the sand fly actually injects into the bite wound which aids and abets this parasite in gaining entrance into the Langerhans cells. And it's quite a complicated process. How big is mm -hmm. this sand fly? Like it's a mosquito? Minute, it's minute. Like a, no, it's, no, it's smaller. much smaller, smaller than, a mosquito. than a mosquito. It's the wimp of the vector species, as far as we know. There are no smaller ones. You'd call them noceums uh, because they're so small that even the finest screens, unless they're really carefully made, will not prevent sand flies from gaining entrance into your domicile. So you really have to be careful about this. Yeah, and it's not that they get through the holes of the screen, right? right. But they get through like any little so break. So thank God they're night, night feeders. Down. They are not yeah. night feeders are they at all. Restricted to sandy areas? No, they're not. In fact, mm -hmm. and it's an unusual situation to find them near sand because they're called sand flies. But basically, they're called sand flies because in the Middle East, they're found in desert conditions. But they're only found near the burrows of animals that live in the desert, like for instance the uh, gerbils and the uh, desert rats and things of this sort. So it, it's got a wide species range of hosts that it, it takes advantage of. And so the sand flies live near the burrows of the animals, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a zoonosis in that case. Yeah, in most parts of the world, there's the, they talk about the zoonotic and the anthro. Right. Um, and so you have ones where it's really the human, but but a lot of cases, this is a huge challenge in South America, there's an animal reservoir. Many, And, many, and we're many. sort of an accidental. That's um, right. But they are restricted. In the lifetime of a sandfly, it may not travel more than, let's say, 50 meters. Right. That's sort of its radius. And it lives right. its whole life there. So it needs to have sure. the ability to take a blood meal, sure. meal in that area. Sure. So sure. you're not going to be wandering through the Sahara and suddenly go like, oh my gosh, I got bitten by a sandfly out here. It, there has to be somewhere where there's going to be an animal okay. or well, a person an oasis, where to take a blood that's meal. That's the place. If you're camped out in the middle of the desert, you're not at risk. Yeah. But if you're near an oasis, you're So you got to go 52 risk. meters from the oasis and then that's exactly right. Camp. Then you're safe. Would you find them in coastal New Jersey, New York? Sandflies. We have 
I think we do have sand flies here because we have yeah. we now have autochthonous leishmaniasis in dogs. Sand flies as far north as southern really? Canada. Yes. We have sand flies all well, over the place. You say we now have. These are culicoides. <laughs> we never had it before. Well, we never had the autochthonous leishmaniasis. It was brought here yeah. in hunting dogs from Europe. I see. I think we talked about this. The fox, yeah, we did. The we fox, did. the fox yeah. hounds. We did exactly. Right. And, and they're and they're a little interesting exception. But let's take a little aside because it's a cool story. <laughs> now you know it's spread through just fox hounds. It wasn't in any other dogs. And yeah. It was a big mm. sort of epicenter in Tennessee. But eighteen states and got Kentucky. involved back oh, in the right. that's right back in the nineties. And uh, could, dogs, how, were, dogs, how was it spreading from dog to dog? Right. Well, they do groom each other, right? <laughs> Actually, it was they they scrap <clears throat> around. And they were biting each other. It was not vector spread in the dogs. Yeah. It was when they were scrapping wow. around, biting scrapping each other. There were even yeah. some transfusion. I'll be um, yeah, it was pretty darned. interesting. We just heard stuff. a big presentation on the uh, Tasmanian devil facial tumor. You heard a presentation on it? It was actually here <laughs> at Columbia, well, in your absence, of course. Someone were, gave a talk about that, really? They did, and that's transmitted cool. by the bite of the Tasmanian yeah, devil. Right. <clears throat> so here's another example of a parasite that's transmitted by the... Oh, yeah. That's not a parasite, actually. So in this case, we confirmed it was leishmaniasis, but but let's get back to did something... You, did you request okay. the punch biopsy, by the way? No, actually, sure. it was done, and then the patient was sent. I hey, see. look what we found. This, okay. this, and, yeah. and we were involved. This patient ended up getting treated with amphotericin. Um, hmm. But let's talk that's about more, what are the treatment options yeah. and why do we choose certain treatment options. Sure. And that really comes back to the fact that there are... I'm going to say three different clinical manifestations of leishmaniasis. Um, there's visceral leishmaniasis. Yep. There's cutaneous leishmaniasis. Right. And I'm going to the third one. I'm going to say mucocutaneous leishmaniasis. Excellent. Um, and a couple things is that different types of leishmaniasis can cause different diseases. And in this case, we're dealing in this gentleman with a cutaneous form of leishmaniasis. The um, mucocutaneous leishmaniasis is mainly a problem in South America, particularly in Brazil. That's how you can remember, Brasiliensis is, is usually the species. Um, or Peru is another hotbed. And a certain percent of the time, the entry might be cutaneous. Mm. But then years later, it might erupt. And, and where does it erupt? It could erupt in the lungs. It can erupt up in the mouth, in the sinuses. Or a genital um, tract, too. It can, yeah, any, any mucosal surface. Exactly. Can. So in this case, we've got a gentleman with this um, cutaneous form. But there's a lot of variations to the cutaneous form. Like when you were describing your, your lab friend <laughs> lab acquired who, who got it on the finger, we yeah. sometimes see manifestations that they call a sporotrichoid manifestation. Oh. And uh, it looks like a spore. Trichosis is something where, let's say, someone works with so fungal um, infection, roses, yes. often, yeah, often, oh, okay. often fungal. And it'll be in the fingertips, and you'll get s potentially several nodules. Sometimes you'll actually get it in the lymph nodes, and it'll be mistaken for plague, right? Eek. Um, so there can be these atypical magnifications. The visceral leishmaniasis, which this is not. Um, some people, I think, made some references to. Um, there is visceral leishmaniasis. There is the, the particular type of leishmaniasis that can cause visceral disease in Italy. Um, From which parasite? It's usually inf infantum yes. in Italy. Yes. Um, and why do we call it infantum? Because it infects the infants. Um, it's right. often a That's disease right. of children. Yep. Kala Azar. That's in, <laughs> India. That's in <laughs> India. That means black fever. But it isn't... It it's like, Hindi it for visceral leishmania. Yeah, of course. It is visceral leishmania. But what color is ours? Hindi? Yeah. So leishmania, Donovani, those are the names. And Leishman and Donovan submitted papers together from different parts of India to the British Medical Journal, and Ronald Ross reviewed them and said, these mm. are the same, this is the same disease. Let's call it leishmania, Donovani. And that's what it's known as today. Mm -hmm. Another little bon mot. Yes, yeah, so let's say, can we yeah. sag into visceral? So, so what is visceral leishmaniasis? Right. Um, visceral leishmaniasis, instead of the parasites just infecting the skin and, and the lesion expanding at sort of that edge, the interface between the immune system and the parasites, right. this actually gets in the body, disseminates, um, and because we know it's excited about mononuclear cells, about our immune cells, you can end up with probably the biggest spleens, the, the yep. largest splenic enlargement of yep. 
definitely beyond malaria. Sure. Um, the liver can expand. Cool it can get into period. the it can yeah. get into the bone marrow. That's right. And uh, Gulf War syndrome. Well, let's talk about that because what species was that that infected those people over there from the United States of America that, that had yeah. never been in the Middle East before? Yeah, the, this was a little bit of a, a not your classical tropical this medicine. This is a red herring not, type yeah, of... It was, it was not what was endemic in those areas. <laughs> well, actually... Um, well, I guess, no. How, no, the how people I word were that? endemic. The, p- <laughs> the people there were not getting this. We were, you know... Yeah, we they would are get the, the cutaneous form it. of this, wouldn't they? Exactly. But we got a visceralizing form form of the cutaneous leishmaniasis, L. tropica, which is not supposed Mm -hmm. to be a visceral form, but in U.S. troops, our immunogenetics, I guess, was slightly different from the endemic populations, and this parasite jumped into the viscera Mm -hmm. and created a more serious problem than just cutaneous leishmaniasis. Yeah, and visceral leishmaniasis untreated um, is much like rabies. You die. Right, unless you're treated. If oh, you said untreated. Yeah, untreated. Right? So even with treatment, even maybe with, you try. Even with treatment, sometimes the treatments are worse than the disease, but sometimes, well, <clears throat> even with treatment, they estimate yes. 5 to 10%. And it depends on the area because mm. there tends to be regional differences in the yes. virulence of, of leash right. mania. You called it Gulf War Syndrome, right? He did. Why did why he did? Why, why did, <laughs> did we, I do that? This, did is, that. this is not a this is a known disease, an infectious right. disease. I mean, it was but, known for a while by the army as Gulf War Syndrome. So guess how many people? This is what it, yeah, that's what I wanted to ask you. How many people got it? No, it's not how many people got it. It's how many people went to the Gulf. I don't know. Over six hundred thousand. Wow. So those people, when they came back in the army, could never give blood again. Mm-hmm. That's a huge absence of resource for the army because in an emergency situation in combat everybody's eligible to give blood but these guys would never be eligible again of those how many got visceral a minor proportion of those but that was what was initially called gulf war syndrome that's correct it wasn't anything well, I would no, say it, it no. made up I would say it made up a certain percent. So you could still say Gulf was, War syndrome and within that a certain yeah, okay. percent were diagnosed with right. post traumatic stress disorder that's basically what they came back suffering from because of their combat uh, experiences that that is Gulf War syndrome, but some had but, visceral leishmaniasis. They had the fevers. It, the maybe they were immunosuppressed because being in combat is yeah, an immunosuppressive yeah. event, to say the least. These mm-hmm. organisms took advantage of that. And After World War Two, was there PTS? Oh my gosh, but, yes, but they didn't, didn't call it that. We didn't they call it. We didn't that. talk about it. Either, no, right? they call it shell shock. Shell shock. Okay, that's what they call it. Mm-hmm. Mm. But it's all the same stuff, and you know, war is hell, no matter which way you look at it. Yeah. I wanted to ask you this, uh, our friend Elise, who says, if you treat it earlier, do you have less scarring? Is that, uh, it must be true, right? So that, that actually brings up some good, um, some good points, some good issues. In certain parts of the world, so the first answer is yes. In certain parts of the world um, where there's a lot of Leishmania tropica, we talked about that's a cutaneous form in a lot of parts of the world, say the Middle East, getting into the India area, they will actually find someone who has a skin lesion like our gentleman, they will scrape the edge of the lesion and then they will inoculate children. Why, why are they doing that? Mm-hmm. Because often if you've had an infection, it will scar. And you don't want to end up with a sand fly bite on the face, mm-hmm. particularly yeah. you know, um, if you're thinking you ever might want to marry or something or, or interact socially with other human beings. So what they'll do is they'll actually inoculate in a covered part of the body, hmm. um, often the buttocks area, so that when the scarring develops, um, it's it's not going to be so obvious, so disfiguring. And there's a classic um, description of these scars. There's sort of a thinning, um, a um, almost like someone put too many steroids on an area, so it's kind of a shiny hmm. um, skin atrophy that develops in the area where these scar. Now, when the um, lesion is developing, there's all these... Um, parasites in the edge of the lesion and there's there's in some cases a natural resolution just give it enough time and it will resolve but again that depends on the species some species are really going to take months and months and months um the sooner you decrease the parasitic load the sooner you're going to stop this this growth of the ulcer 
And there are several different ways of treating it and several different reasons of treating it. Well, one, you might treat it, as, as mentioned, for cosmetic regions. You don't want this to expand. Mm-hmm. You also may not want to have an ulcer for a month, right, or two months, depending <laughs> on the species, right? Even though it's painless. Even though it's painless, because we don't we we don't like skin no, we lesions. Don't. Human Susie beings really don't like skin upset lesions. Upset over the fact that after the first week the novelty wore off and she still had to keep her finger infected for photographic purposes. <laughs> you know, she got tired of it after a while. And decided yeah, I can, to get I can cured. see that. And the hot waters we talk, that's just going to sort yeah, of uh, you know it'll get better for a while, but then it's just probably yeah. going to so come back. Let me ask you but this: what are, But what are our okay. treat? What are our treatment uh, options? So we'll start first. off with treatment options for cutaneous. Perfect. Let's say it's just just good old cutaneous. It's not a form that has a mucocutaneous potential, right? We're not in right. South America. Right. Um, you, you're, you're treating it because you want to avoid the things we just discussed. We're not dealing with mucocutaneous next. So you can treat it um, with, in some places, they actually heat it up really hot. They actually use radio waves to destroy the cells wow. that are inhabited by the, by the parasite. And and that can be effective. In other areas, they'll actually freeze. They'll use That's they'll freeze the th- freeze the area. In other areas, what they'll do is they'll numb it up and they'll actually inject um, pentavalent antimony. So they inject antimony Sodium into the lesion, which is yeah, which is really painful and um, highly toxic. In other parts of the world, and actually, this is species dependent in in amphotericin, the liposomal forms of amphotericin. Interesting enough, this is if you had visceral leishmaniasis, oh, yeah, that too, a single that. dose right. is probably effective. Right. For cutaneous, and this may be the issue of penetration, getting the medicine in there, right. mm. um, they recommend more, you know, so a series sure. of doses. Sure. But actually very, very effective in strength. Okay. Now, in some areas of the world, they use fluconazole, so I'm saying like the azoles probably have some efficacy, so the ketoconazole approach. Yep, yep, yep. It's not saying that was, you know... It, I well, in the old days, that's it, all we had was yeah. ketoconazole. In the old so days, you know, it. you're... you're, you're taking your horse to get to work and you don't you have electricity to, and you got ketoconazole. Yeah, well, no, we still have ketoconazole. We do. It. You, it's still an antifungal for toenail yeah. infections and stuff yeah. like this. So, so certain so. parts of the world, I guess like Columbia in the 80s, they might have uh, resorted to well, that. You know. So there's another approach to diagnosis that we missed that okay. you might want to mention. Oh, what do, you, what do you... So there are molecular techniques. I don't know if that's your, what you're no. interested in. Um, what other we techniques? We can actually culture this organism. You can culture this, yes. So what would you culture it in? Well, there's a couple different choices, and uh, so, so people, the out, biopsy, people out there might half want to do this for histology, uh, half for culture. Yeah, I, what would you throw it into? What is it like triple D solution or something? Is that why you remember it? No, there's a couple different no. things that will grow in. I don't think does I it, does made it need any cells kind of to note. grow. No, 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 it, it will can grow, grow cell free. It grows in cell free conditions, but what organism would feed at the margins of the ulcer to acquire the infection? Organism would feed it. Sand flies. Sand flies right. So, what is the body temperature of a sand fly? Mm, Twenty degrees. About. Mm, sand, and sand so, degree. you would use an insect tissue culture medium mm-hmm. to get this organism to grow. All right. So it's called Schneider's medium. Yeah. And Schneider's medium is an easy one to obtain Schneider. because the Drosophila people right. use it all the time. Mm-hmm. But in the old days, we used it to culture the organism. And what would you get in that culture? Promastigotes? Thank you. Mm. Yeah. Look, the non-parasitologist speaketh. Mm. The non-eukaryotic <laughs> parasitologist. The non-scientist. No, no, no. I, you're I, a I great think, scientist. I, 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 think you're a great scientist. Is, I think Vincent is becoming a parasitologist. <laughs> I, you know, he didn't <laughs> miss the diagnosis a, either. Becoming a parasite. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I've been doing this for 88 episodes. No, you're absolutely right. Hey, and we, no, we've covered this once before, but not mention, from the clinical side. So I should mention just a couple other therapies please, before we move on to mucocutaneous. So Dixon will remember paramycin. Oh yeah, do you remember that drug? Yeah, I do remember the, the luminal stage of amoebiasis. Sure. It's a it's actually an aminoglycoside similar to gentamicin. Yeah. Um, now aminoglycosides are not absorbed, so you can actually apply this know that. topically no, to know the that. Um, to the ulcers. Oh boy! And um, the other miltefazine. That's something you get no through the. Tefazine. It's an oral agent. An expensive oral agent that you can get through this. Oh, we would highly recommend that one. In the <laughs> United States, you could only use miltefacin. <laughs> what so, is the mode of action of that drug? I'm not sure how miltefacin works. Oh. I don't remember offhand. Okay. Can I ask an unrelated question? A punch biopsy. Yes. So, uh, Muhammad what, what Ali. Is, what is a punch biopsy? 
<laughs> uh, and, and I appreciate you bringing that because a lot of times we do that, you know, and I listen to me, what is a punch by? Yeah. I never mentioned it, but, you know, and we, yeah. we assume that, well, everyone knows it's a punch biopsy. Exactly. Um, I didn't do a lot of punch biopsies when I was in clinical practice for a couple reasons, but mm. well, let me just discuss how you do it. He was a pacifist. You, <laughs> <laughs> you have a, um, a cylinder that um, if, if you guys, anyone have a pen, anyone who's listening with a pen, who's not driving, if you, um, if you disassemble your pen and you look at the inside of your pen, there's basically going to be a metal tube, like, right? Yeah, like a a metal metal, it's basically tube. a metal tube, or you think about a straw. So let's say the end of your straw or your metal tube is sharp. What you do is you numb up an area, and then you take that metal tube, and you push and twist, and it pops through. Mm-hmm, so you're going right. to get all the top layers. That's right. um, that is your punch. So right. the diameter is small. So the diameter is small. The diameter is about a, about a varies. centimeter, but you, you a have centimeter. these. You have these. A centimeter. They have their you're choices. Kidding, not a millimeter. <laughs> <laughs> That's no, you're actually, you take, well, well. Are you taking from the center of series. the lesion or from the edge? You, edge. Know what, you know what the difference is between a small punch biopsy and a large punch biopsy? <laughs> it's like if they're doing it on me, it's large, and but on my patient, it's small. That's right. Yeah. Exactly. They, um, right. Y- you can get these in kits where you have all the different sizes, and depending right. upon the size yeah. of the lesion, you may choose a different diameter of the punch Correct. but you're going to usually infiltrate the area with a numbing agent mm-hmm. um, a lidocaine with epi unless you're on a digit and um, it will raise up and then you'll pop this through and then you often just put a stitch in and if you stretch the skin a little yep. and then do the punch biopsy the skin approximates mm-hmm. better mm-hmm. Sure. Um, I, ha- I have to admit that was a- when I was in clinical practice, I'm out in Colorado a lot of the time, I'm not rushed, I would often make a nice elliptical biopsy. I, I thought it-, it gave a better dermatological result. Do you um, know where they got their idea from to make a punch biopsy? No, device? no. I can tell you. They got it probably from the old laboratory workers who had cork borers. Mm-hmm. So you have a series of cork yeah, borers yeah. from this diameter all the way down to that diameter. And those are old world. That goes way back, you know, <laughs> the days of Ehrlich. When I, <laughs> I opened my lab here in 1982, yes. I ordered a set of cork borers. Of bores. course, of course. Yeah, I had because them too. back then we used to have rubber stoppers exactly right. and you needed to put holes in them you for got various it. purposes. And that's a punch and biopsy my, for a <laughs> well, I remember one of my first students, what do you need this for? Clinicians <laughs> should practice with cork borers first and then go to the punch <laughs> biopsy apparatus. <laughs> yeah, it's not, it's not hard to do. I, I think no, what I've but... trained people is it's just getting them to apply the pressure until they get the pop through so that you actually get the, yeah. the full. You don't want to take a bone marrow the full. with those. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're not, no, you're not, you're not going to do that. People, if anything, people usually hesitate on too right. soft and right. too shallow right. Right. and then it makes it more difficult. But in the old days, we used mm-hmm. to do a lot of culturing for this organism from people coming back with undiagnosed lesions of various kinds so yeah got it yeah and right. if there's clinicians in, in, out there North that Africa, are you know what we call this one the french foreign lesion <laughs> <laughs> i like that french no but if there's cl- lesion <laughs> so what would that that be a leishman that's the dermal leishmaniasis yeah. well maybe we have a title huh French, Maybe the French. I, I like that. For okay, so we so we talked about the cutaneous and different ways of treating it, <laughs> and but the other issue is, is there's sometimes a reason why it's more urgent that we treat it, and we discussed or alluded to Brasiliensis, the type of leishmaniasis that That's is um, present <clears throat> in South America. So let's say you're in Brazil. And someone has a cutaneous lesion, and they say, oh, I'm just going to let it heal on my own. Why do I even bother treating? Because they do have both of them there, right? Well, the Brasiliensis, even though it affects you initially as a cutaneous lesion, 2 to 3% of the time, and again, I'm going to say this depends on the region. Some areas it's lower or higher. um, It will then, years later, will erupt as a mucocutaneous um, lesion. So years later, the person may report a nasal stuffiness or whatever symptom, and then you realize that now it has erupted in the mouth, it's eroded through the palate, the septum Mm. is partially gone. So in those cases, there's there's an interest and urgency to know the um, type of leishmaniasis you're dealing with and and treat it. Um, Now again, are you gonna get rid of it 100%? Probably not again if they become immunosuppressed or infected with HIV, for instance. Uh, you, you may not have gotten 100% of it gone. I'm going to say right. you, you, you probably don't ever get 100% of this gone, but you sure. suppress it to a point where you minimize the chance of relapse. Right. So, doctor, um, I'm a patient, mm-hmm. and you've asked me all the right questions, and you've asked me, have you ever had leishmaniasis? 
And I said, yes, I've had cutaneous leishmaniasis. So this can't possibly be yeah. and oh, it leishmaniasis. Was, and oh, it was, yeah. No, it went all, it's all better. And But then you want to know, well, where were you? What strain do I have to worry? Well, about? if I've had cutaneous leishmaniasis, am I susceptible to the visceral or to the mucocutaneous leishmaniasis still? Or does it, is there a cross protection? Well, if you, let's say you were in Brazil and you got the cutaneous that's how you get the mucocutaneous. It comes initially as cutaneous, maybe not even particularly obvious. You know, it may be a small, won't necessarily be a large lesion, but it's years later that it erupts. It's kind of like the tuberculosis or something where you know, you get it initially, but right. then years later it for some reason is able to But they've to, got tons of just cutaneous leishmaniasis down there too. Yeah, tons and is there it. and is there something protective? Right. And that's an issue, not always unfortunately. You can get actually reinfected. Exactly. Um, yeah, so having it once is not necessarily But gonna, you are completely protected from a re uh, introduction of the cutaneous leishmaniasis if you scarify. And that yeah, that's the that's so what we that talked about. So that does protect against itself, but you don't get any cross protection with other species of leishmaniasis. At least that's how I learned it. No, that's true. And that's why the scarification is used. And you, you tend to get a pretty robust um, immune response. But then again, it's not going to protect against all types of, right. of leishmaniasis. So where did they get that idea from, do you think? Of the scarification? Yeah. Edward Jenner. <laughs> no. Beyond, way before that. 11th century Chinese were doing there it for you, smallpox. Yeah. Exactly. It was called so variolation. Here's, here's the bridge. Yeah. Here's the bridge. So in Russia... The bridge is out there. Thank you. <laughs> I am pointing to that bridge. So the bridge of knowledge starts with an older folklore mm -hmm. remedy for a very serious disease. And they say, well, if it works for that, maybe it'll work for... And they tried lots of other things, right? But it certainly worked for this. So in Russia, yeah. apparently, it was the largest single scarification immunization program in the world beyond smallpox. They immunized a couple of million people all in the same month, something like that, to get rid of mm -hmm. cutaneous yeah. leishmaniasis. By the way, according to WHO, <coughs> yes, 300,000 cases a year of visceral, sure. 20,000 yeah. deaths every year yeah. 1 million cases of cutaneous oh. in the last 5 years yeah and 300 million people are at risk in 6 countries 300 million for visceral 300 million it's incredible it's yeah a lot. it is, it is. Yeah. and it vi is. visceral is as you know we tried to point out is a very serious um, you bet. and almost uniformly fatal diagnosis and how do you diagnose that you know you've got this guy he comes uh, back he's he or she um, has been in a part of the world Fever, you notice Keep the going. enlarged spleen and Keep liver, going. you start and to liver. think of That it. was very important, by the way, what you just said. Yeah. And liver. You start to think of this dying there. They're a little bit dark. So you think of your Hindi, Kala Azar, the dark sickness. Um, so you're thinking of this. How do you diagnose it? Now, in, in parts of the world where they see a lot of this, They'll actually do splenic biopsies. And I'm going to discourage That's that. Very dangerous, <laughs> very dangerous. They, they, you mm -hmm. take a needle. Um, you've got your syringe with the needle on the end. You put it under the skin, and now you put suction on the syringe. But it's under the skin, so it's not gonna not gonna pull back. And then they will one, two, three into the spleen and out. <laughs> and you look at it. I didn't get anything, but you squirt whatever you did get onto a slide. Actually, very sensitive. But they studied this in Brazil, and they realized, you know, everyone <laughs> says I'm good at this, and we don't have problems, and I never have a problem. But you know, and then if you look closely, you realize that yeah, people people bleed into the peritoneum. It's not a great idea to take a sharp thing and poke a spleen, particularly when it's mm. enlarged and infected or with parasites. So you know, if if you wanted to do something bone marrow, they'll often be in the bone right. marrow. And we have molecular techniques. And actually, in parts of the world now, the kineto. What's that kineto thing that you parasites like to parasitologists like to talk about? <laughs> the kineto plants. You mean the degenerated <laughs> mitochondrion? Oh, that. <laughs> that thing. Well, they actually have an antigen test where you take a drop ah, of blood yes, and on. you're looking for for ah, that. Um, I think it's kinetoplast sixty seven or so. Sure, I'd be. I'd have to sure. look up the number. But anyway, you can actually take a drop of blood and screen without having to poke spleen. So, so that. That does sort of beg the question, if it's so difficult to find these organisms in the blood, then how easy is this to transmit to another sand fly? And it must be very easy because it's widespread. So therefore, some blood test 
not placing the patient at high risk would be the perfect one to develop. And I believe there are PCR tests. Now. Yeah, so there, there are PCR tests, and that's a really that's an interesting issue. How is it spread? Right? You yeah, know, we talked about the fact that it's, you know you're not going to just draw blood and send it off for a leash mania culture. Unfortunately, there's a a rare but very problematic manifestation of Leishmaniasis. This dermal form, oh this chronic oh, dermal that's, Leishmaniasis, oh, that's, that's, where people, patients, you know. um, not even just in, so definitely immunosuppressed, yeah, okay, but there's sorry. also probably you know something's up with their immune system. It doesn't happen to everyone. It's rare, but they end up with um, the parasites uh, all through their skin. It's, a horrible and, manifestation. And these, you get these people finger like projections. It's just yeah, and these people can be huge transmitters, right? Because post Cala Azar dermal leishmanoid. It's known as post Cala Azar dermal leishmanoid. In the most immunosuppressed. Yeah, so they've patients. been treated. They've gotten right. better, so Not to speak. Treated fully. Yeah, but no, even they may have gone under like okay, our okay. full what we thought was okay. the right treatment. Okay. But as we talked about. Our treatments don't 100% eradicate, don't right. clear it. So sometimes they'll end up with this. And that's a problem in areas when you're trying to yes. eradicate it. If you've got these sort of super spreaders, you could call them. So wasn't there a t some time in the past during our immunology growth period of knowledge, there was something called intrinsic factor or something like that that they could derive from activated macrophages, which could restore immune competency in patients missing a certain factor that they could get from macrophages. I believe it was called intrinsic factor, but I'm blocking on the name actually. Because these patients that exhibited the most um, bizarre form of post-dermal uh, leishmanoid uh, reaction could be set back to a normal immunologic pattern. And by the, by the way, it would confuse these people with uh, a, a typical... Uh, or an atypical, sorry, an atypical uh, leprosy patient as well because mm -hmm. they could develop these skin lesions and things like, like that, that, yeah, and that you might yeah, start to confuse yeah. everything together. No, it's interesting you bring that because there are the clinical manifestations which remind us of the usefulness of that TH1, yeah, TH2. Yeah, that, you can have people right. with exuberant um, cellular immune responses with sure. very few parasites. Sure. Um, and that's the most effective approach is yeah. this. But there also is a, um, an antibody um, effective to some degree but these people tend to have more you know and you can get antibody levels in these yeah, people yeah, yeah. but those people often have less inflammation let's say but more organisms so you right. can end up with sort of the tuberculoid right. Right. lepromatous yes. spectrum to yeah, leishmaniasis right. this was thought to be an rna derivative uh -huh. so it I'll, I'll try to come up with that some other time uh, i don't want to be late but no and as, now, as dixon but. comments this is a huge problem in the world uh, yeah. vincent gave us the numbers on it and um a lot of it is now that we don't use ddt now that we're not treating um the insect right. populations That's right. That's right. Uh, there's a lot of people <laughs> on this planet who are at risk of uh this disease it's true I wonder if there's a spike in the cutaneous leishmaniasis during the Cannes Film Festival. Because <laughs> there's a lot of skin exposed during that time. I, is, is that I what, you're, that's that's what sure. you're alluding to? But no, and as I mentioned, um, a lot of people now, they're going to um, Costa Rica, these other vacation places where sure. they put themselves um, in the presence of okay. these little sand flies. And Good reason just to stay here, Dixon. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, come on, come on. Life's no fun unless you take a few chances. Can we do a paper? Yeah, we can. We have a really cool paper I'd love today, to do a paper. Which is published in Nature recently, and it's yes. called Tyleria Parasites Secrete a Prolyl Isomerase to Maintain Host Leukocyte Transformation. And oh. the first author is Marsolier, and the last is Weitzman. And these individuals are from the University of Paris, the University of Burgundy, Harvard Medical School, uh, Parasitology Laboratory in... Tunisia, and even the University of Georgia, they're all over the place. Right. Dixon, what is Tyleria? Tyleria. I'm so glad you asked. Did we ever talk about it on Twitter? <laughs> no, because it's not a human parasite. So we, we were concentrating. What, do we have a law? We have a law. In Twitter. We don't have a law against that, but we have, we've had limited amount of time to spend for the animal world besides people. <clears throat> so Tyleria is an apicomplexa. All right. It's in the apicomplexa group. So we've already talked a lot about others. Yep. Malaria. Uh, toxoplasma, cryptosporidium, cyclospora, and now here's another one. Tyleria. Tyleria, but it's only in cattle. Cattle. <clears throat> so it's a cattle parasite. It's a, it's a eukaryotic, protozoan, multi, uh, obligate intracellular parasite. Is it multicellular? <clears throat> no, no, no. It's Single protozoan. Single cell. It's a protozoan. 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 Apicomplexa. 
Prozone. One cell. One cell. Is it flagellated? No. Doesn't matter though. No, it's not. It's not. It's not. <laughs> cattle. Only cattle. Just cattle. Wild or domesticated, or both. That's a very good question. I believe it can affect uh, infect things like bison and uh, gnus. Mm. You hear about the bison who got out of upstate New York? I did not. <laughs> <laughs> sure, that wasn't a coyote. <laughs> no, the, like a five bison. bison got out of a farm and were wandering around. No, they never... just shot them all. Oh, oh really? that? Yeah. No, I do remember that. Yeah, I do remember that. Maybe yeah. they had Tyleria. Mm, I don't think so. We don't have it in this country. We, we don't. Have, we have another cattle disease in this country, Babesia, which will give shipping disease. No, no, no. That's this brucellosis. <laughs> <All right, laughs> Come where on, do let... you find Tyleria? Tyleria? It's in Africa. Oh, Daniel it's, probably uh... never encountered it, right? So it's, it's not um, human. <laughs> it's interesting. It's um, yeah. We, we we as we talk about Tilira, we may have to change that catchphrase. You know, parasites the ones that make you we sick. I guess the a, ones that make like everybody make, sick. <laughs> yeah, that's right. the, everybody the ones that sick. control populations in ecology. <laughs> yeah, it's the big concentration of Tilaria is in central eastern Africa. Yes. Now there is Tilaria, other species. There's three. I'll say three main ones, but there's several species of Tilaria. And um, but it also is an issue in um, the Indian subcontinent and down into um, Southeast Asia. Okay. But the real hotbed is Africa, yep. and it's a challenge there because they're trying to uh, introduce cattle introduce into cattle Africa, into, which is because the entire from? eastern part of Africa is one basic grassland, right? That's where mm. the Serengeti Plain is, and you go down even further, you can find more grassland. So, the idea of commercializing cattle production in Africa is up for grabs in terms of whether that's a good idea or not, because you're going to displace a lot of natural... Is this uh, include the Rift Valley? Is that grassy? Yeah, that's right down the heart of the Rift yeah. Valley. It's in the absolute heart of the Rift Valley. You got it. You know what they make in the Rift Valley? Rift Valley fever. <laughs> <laughs> they do. You know what else they make? They make... Well, they make a lot of things. Go on, tell us what... Well, I'm going to show you a picture of what they make. Oh, you are? Because I found it. They make... Uh, hmm. on the store shelves. I'm scrolling oh, down my billions and billions of photos here. We'll get there very soon. You, you have no further guesses? In the Rift Valley, they mm. make something? Who's they, first of all? Is this, uh, farmers. Like, farmers. Oh, the farmers. Oh, I see. Farmers. They make uh, honey? Here we go. No, that's not it. Sorry. No, go ahead. I have pictures of you and Daniel here. It's <laughs> not what I'm looking for. I... They make coffee, actually. Oh, okay. So Kenya is very famous for and coffee. So, so I went here. It is. I went into. Uh, um, I I drink Kenyan coffee all the Starbucks time. Starbucks, and I saw this Rift Valley coffee. That's a very isn't interesting. that funny? Yeah, well, it's, that is. That's and, and I'm used to mostly, Rift Valley as a virus. Mostly and they have Kenya. a picture of Africa, and they even have yeah. show where it is. Yeah, and I always think yeah. of coffee as being up on the mountains, right? They always so yeah. here we are down in the valley. Maybe you know. Well, <laughs> if you if you've ever seen the movie Out of Africa. Right? Okay. The this Isaac is, Dennison novel this turned into a movie. This is from Rwanda. It was. Rwanda has lots of coffee, too, because they have lots of upland regions and they have no. gorillas, right? Uh, so we, there's a, we, tons yeah. of coffee plantations and tons of uh, tea plantations in Africa. What does uh, Tyleria do to a cow? Yeah, well, that's the story, isn't it's it? bad? So, of course it is. It's a multi-system disease disorder which results in high mortality rates. How is it spread? Ticks. Okay. Ripicephalus and <laughs> Ripicephalus. That's number one species, and there's an that's a genus rather. And the other one, I'm uh, begins with H, and I've blocked it off my. All right, so this is bad for the cows. Experience. Not good it's for it makes the cows. It makes the cows sick. But what I want to <laughs> to say, because everybody seems to think that I'm a good storyteller. All right, they, so they, I have a little not, they story. Don't seem to think they do. Still well, I have a little story good. that I want. We haven't inter- had a story from you in a yeah, long well, time. Well, I want to interject good. one now because this. Goes right back to All the right, very I'm kick back. Kick back. Grab yourself a favorite beverage. I'll, I'll slump. I like to slump. He's gonna That's slump. how I relax. Well, I've been slumping for years because of the aging process. What can I tell you? So, I spent my best three years of my science career at Rockefeller University in Theobald Smith Hall. So that raises the question, of course, who was Theobald Smith? And Theobald Smith turns out to be a very interesting person who got involved in infectious diseases at the turn of the century. It actually was before that. Okay, It, was, it predates uh, Ronald Ross's expedition into India as part of the British Medical Service. The 20th century? Yeah, well, barely. Hmm. Barely. Okay, so Theobald Smith and Bruce and others of their ilk, 
you know, uh, descendant from Louis Pasteur's discovery of all these microbes that might be important or might not be important depending on what. So he got the, I, I would say he got the bug <laughs> for looking for bugs. And so, but he was primarily in the United States. He got his degree at no other place than there's only one place to get your degree, and that's Cornell, right, Vincent? Because <laughs> that's where he went to. <laughs> and he was interested in veterinary medicine, and yeah, Cornell has a school. wonderful yeah. veterinary school. And um, so he came out and then got a job uh, in various places, but ended up at Rockefeller. Uh, but it wasn't called Rockefeller University in those days. It was just called Rockefeller Institute for Medical Research, mm -hmm. and primarily in Princeton. Not in, in New York City, primarily in Princeton. He got involved in looking into this cattle disease, which was present throughout the southwestern part of the United States, and what was it, and, and so it was called uh, Texas cattle fever. Texas cattle fever, what causes it? So they football, looked in- Football games. It's a- Absolutely. <laughs> no, that was with pigskin. I'm sorry. <laughs> so you've got these cattle and they're all dying from something. And see, well, Smith wanted to know what are they dying mm -hmm. from. And, and they found out they were dying from an infection because you could transmit it from one animal to the next. But it was very difficult to transmit it. And the reason why it turned out to be difficult to transmit is because it turned out to involve a vector. Now, they had never heard of the word vector before that. All right. They suspected that there were vectors involved in the transmission of disease. That goes all the way back to the Romans and bad air, mal area, and they thought it came from swamps and stuff. And it did, of course, in the form of a mosquito that transmitted the disease. But it took a long time to establish that vectors, arthropods of all kinds, could serve as vectors for disease. And you'll, Theobald Smith is credited as the first person to ever scientifically demonstrate that Babesia, which infects cattle and causes Texas fever, mm -hmm. was transmitted by none other than the Lone Star Tick. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so tick-borne infection was the first infectious disease ever clinically and scientifically pinpointed as this organism in that tick infects that animal and that animal gets sick. And if that animal gives that infection back to another tick that's not infected, that infected tick can now infect another animal and reproduce the disease. And that's Cook's postulates. And so Theobald Smith became elevated to sainthood, basically, in mm -hmm. science mm -hmm. as the very first person to ever discover the transmission of a vector-borne disease. And it turned out to be a eukaryotic parasite. But mm -hmm. as we all know, there are plenty of viruses and some bacteria that are also transmitted yeah. this way, right? Like, like rickettsia. And so, he has a building named after and him. And he, they, well, he you know, eventually ended up working at the Rockefeller uh, yeah. scientific community. And they adopted his name. And of course, you mentioned another one earlier today, Simon Flexner, who was also very famous for working on infectious diseases. Right, because the mm -hmm. Flexneroi is named after him, right? Mm -hmm. Shigella Flexneroi. So, so yep. now we have a history of vector-borne diseases, which comes forward in the form of tyleriosis. Yeah, and now we're going to discuss that parasite, which has a long lineage of history of of work on it because of the uh, vector-borne uh, aspect. So, it's a tick-borne infection, and it's it replicates inside the tick mm -hmm. and in fact both sexual stages are found in the tick so therefore the tick turns out to be the definitive host mm -hmm. the cattle are just carriers for the infection just like we're carriers for malaria the mosquito is the definitive host in that case so it's a similar pattern with one very 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 interesting twist mm -hmm. malaria parasites when they're injected into us by the mosquito the sporozoites where do they go they don't go into red cells right away, do they? They go into the liver. Liver, right. And there's a receptor for these uh, sporozoites, mm -hmm. which they encounter, and they can now penetrate into a hepatocyte, and mm -hmm. then they replicate inside there. And then when they emerge, they can no longer go back into the hepatocyte, but now what do they do? They infect red cells. Mm -hmm. And that starts that cycle. And they build up levels of, of infected red cells until the mosquitoes can actually acquire the disease. And that's their life cycle. You can mm -hmm. imagine they're sitting around a, a little campfire and they're all, here's, they've got slides on the board and the female mosquitoes are saying, now in order to avoid <laughs> malaria, you've got to not bite an infected person. 
You know, I used to have that as a cartoon that I used to show my, <laughs> my medical students because they used to say, wait a minute, aren't we worried about us? We're not worried about mosquitoes, but they are too because, you know, they suffer from this too, I imagine. All right, so, because they're not interested in malaria. They're they interested in blood. They don't live very long anyway. Ticks, however, yeah, they don't live long, but boy, do ticks live long. Ticks can live 20 years without even feeding. If they're kept at a certain temperature, they're amazing animals. All right, but I think it's worse if you're a mosquito and you feel you're like you only get to live two and a half weeks. So if you're sick for two days, that's a big deal. Man, that's a huge <laughs> portion of your life devoted just to staying in bed and you can't eat it's and true. you know you can only be fed plasma because yeah. you can't handle the red cells. Okay, so yep. so now we're now we're into the tick-borne uh, part of this life cycle. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, uh, Ry, um, William Traeger, yeah. who was an inheritor of, he knew Theobald Smith. Mm -hmm. He worked in Smith Hall. He did. Mm -hmm. He not only worked there, he knew Theobald Smith. Mm -hmm. Because Bill Traeger, at one point, lived in Princeton and worked in Princeton. Mm -hmm. And then moved to New York when they established the Rockefeller University. First, the medical institute was moved from Princeton to New York. And then they grew into the university system that they are today. So he worked on ticks for a while. And there was a woman that worked with him named Maria Rudzinska who worked out the electron microscopy of Babesia in ticks. So that was a kind of a connection. And I remember vaguely hearing about these at seminars at lunch, but, you know, I was only interested in Trigonella at the time. So some of this went in one ear and came right out the other ear without ever sticking. But, but I do remember them discussing tyleriosis as one of the, the main diseases that if we could find out what's going on in the tick for Babesia, we could probably try to find out what's going on in mm -hmm. tyleria-infected ticks as well. So, so here we have now the big difference, though, between mosquitoes and malaria and ticks and tyleriosis mm -hmm is that when the tick bites you and injects those sporozoites into you, mm -hmm. they don't go into the liver. Where do they go? That's very interesting. Where do they go? So they, it turns out they can go into leukocytes. Leukocytes. So what is a leuco? Like lymphocytes. A lu no, what is, you have to say leukocyte first. <laughs> so what does the word leuco mean? Leuco. It's Greek. White. Bingo. White Bingo. blood cells. They go into white. So when they say leukocytes, what does that mean? White it's, blood cells. So yeah, but there are lots of different kinds, aren't yeah, there? Yeah, there are T cells and keep B going, cells. Keep going, keep going, keep going. I mean, you could go on forever like this, right? There's a zillion of them. Yeah, there are others. Well, there are. Not a zillion, about. Well, <laughs> not <laughs> okay. a zillion. I mean, no, I'm doctor, thank you, and doctor. Split, How many but, others? Yeah, B there cells, are lots. T cells, what the other monocyte, there lymphocytes, right? There are lots. Right? Um, basically, all the immune cells they they but tend not, to go into. Do but, NK cells fall into that category? We think so. And um, what I, about I think that Dixon will. Yeah, and and, and maybe new, we don't know about neutrophils. Uh, but maybe we don't know. Right, probably. but in cattle, okay. the organism but we do, primarily but we do know infects B cells, T cells, monocytes. Okay. So, what are um, the cell types that are infected? From the from the tyleriosis, yes. Yeah, and, the, and the, the ones that I mentioned are the ones that we know are infected. We know they infect T cells, monocytes, um, How B cells. How unusual. Why would they do that? And we think. No, you can't ask why. <laughs> I knew you yeah, were correct. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. What, what is, is the, the biological reason? significance? Yeah, what's the reason of they them prefer infecting a leukocyte leukocytes as opposed to an epithelial cell right. or a fibroblast or a liver or cell? Else, right? Well, actually, yeah. now now we can get that gets us to our paper. It does, doesn't <laughs> it? Yes, that. it does because what happens <laughs> well, after they get included uh, into these macrophages? Apparently, they've evolved to have the ability to manipulate. Um, certain cells, leukocytes, um, and they manipulate them in such a way that these cells, they don't die, No, they proliferate, oh and goodness. they became, become more susceptible for wow. additional infection. So they, they live, the, the, the name is transformed, right? Cells That's live, what they call they it. They divide forever, basically. They are deregulated in terms of mitosis. Yeah, because most cells in our body don't divide all the time. Of course right? not. And so... If, if a virus, or in this case, the tyleria makes a divide, we say it's transformed. You can transform our cells by chemicals or other insults sure, as well. Sure, sure. It's an interesting issue, though. I mean, leukocytes, we have a lot of them, and we they do. turn over very quickly. They do. So I'm at a loss to understand why <laughs> this is necessary for tyleria to, ah. to transform a, a, a leukocyte because— you mean— it can kill it and just move on to the what next one. What is the? One. It does kill. For example, them. HIV replicates in a type of leukocyte called a CD4 sure. T cell, but it's it doesn't, slow. It doesn't transform it's them. It's slow, though. It's right? not so slow. It just kills them on a daily basis, and we make tons more. Okay. You see, that's why I'm puzzled yeah. about tyleria because I don't understand yeah. this. 
strategy. Well, it, the the it transmission does. of HIV is a little bit different than it yeah, is for this. You know, it, you know what it comes down to? Whatever works is there, right? <laughs> right. So, yeah. so what this yeah. parasite is actually doing is growing up more host cells. It so wouldn't happen it, on their own, though. That's the thing. No. It, uh, well, what if you could... Wait a minute. That's a yeah. great question because what if you could prevent the propyl isomerase well, from actually we working? Get, we didn't get there yet. No, we haven't. But... Yeah. But that's a, that's a great question to ask because if you had a drug that interfered with that well, in cattle, could we, you prevent infection? Well, we do. I mean, we're going to learn. But the, the, but it just means that yeah. the cell won't transform. But you said there are millions of them. It doesn't matter. They can just keep growing then, right? Well, that's so, what HIV does. It yeah, but no, this is not the same. And all the newly this is produced, not the same. you know, some of these uh, viruses turn over every six hours and they find new lymphocytes to infect so i don't understand the the strategy of taking a, a few cells and transforming them but obviously it works so we cannot yeah. question these things well, we just, apparently we just they them. don't they don't have access <laughs> to as many cells as you think what, they oh, do that's then. the key point access what do you mean they can't get out once they're in maybe or they need to build up the numbers so that when a tick takes a blood meal it actually acquires the infection that's the whole mm -hmm. point of this because you know, hiv of course gets out of the cell once it's finished right and then goes sure. on to infect more so maybe the tyleria can't come out do you know the life cycle maybe. of this thing well we do so once it goes into the lymphocyte, yeah, let's keep talking what happens next well the next thing they replicate like crazy and yeah. induce this transformation and then the cells, cells that they're divide, living and in they divides get, and they take daughter of thyroid sure and in yeah. each infected cell keeps multiplying and each infected cell keeps multiplying so that it, the cells don't multiply in the absence of the organism they multiply in the presence of the so organism so here's my answer to the question but wait they probably there's can't more. get out that's but why they wait, have to do no this. but wait there's more <laughs> right no they, but if that but was they, the but case they do, but they do get out if this was the case <laughs> then the tick would not acquire this infection does probably. a tick acquire free parasites or infected no, cells no but thank you for asking infected cells <laughs> And it doesn't get infected by ingesting the macrophages or the lymphocytes mm -hmm. either. What does it live on? Ticks. Red cells. So wait a minute. How does this parasite... Well, how does the tick know to take a red cell over? Well, it doesn't know, it doesn't. of course. <laughs> does it? <laughs> no. Well, you would have to ask a tick. Flow cytometry, right? <laughs> You'd have to ask a tick for this one. So the tick sucks up a lot of blood. Everything. I'm, and boy, can they suck up a lot of and blood. And with it goes some macrophages and lymphocytes. Yeah. But that's the not the stage that infects the tick. Which one? Does? Ah, because if you were to take infected I macrophages. Just look up the stage. The life if you were to life. take a single infected <laughs> macrophage and inject it into a tick, the yeah. tick would not become infected. Okay. Oh, I see. So there's a stage that the tick has to acquire Which in order to become it? infected. Which stage is well, it? it's the one that breaks out of. The infected macrophage breaks and out then, of. Yes, remember this is an apicomplexa that's mm. very similar to malaria. So in malaria, I was trying to draw the analogy here, hoping you would catch it. All right. So the analogy is: mosquitoes bite, sporozoites go to the liver. They infect hepatocytes. The hepatocytes produce a stage called cryptozoites because they can't be seen. The cryptozoites then differentiate into merozoites within the hepatocyte. When the hepatocyte bursts open and releases the merozoites, the merozoites can no longer go back into the hepatocytes because they're missing the receptor to get back in. So right, where so do they that, go? That they sense. go into red cells instead. They can't probably proliferate in the red cell, right? Oh, yes, they, they can. Do. They're called schizonts. Remember, we went through the life cycle of the malaria parasite. Yeah. So they've got schizonts. See, this doesn't make any sense. So <laughs> no, because you're a virologist, that's why. <laughs> we're no, trying, not, to, not we're trying to bring you into the fold It doesn't here. make sense. We're bringing you into the fold. It, it has to allow the parasites to mature to the next stage. Mm -hmm. So the next stage is called a pyroplasm. So we've left the leukocytes behind, right? We have at yeah, this point. So that point. explains it. So now it's, it's like go, malaria. It's now it's like malaria. Fine. I got it. And it, yeah. well, sense. Babesia works the same way. Babesia works the same way. Okay. We've explained it. Yeah. Makes sense. Fine. And it got needs it. time, So from right? that I point mean, on, you've got all the apicomplexa <laughs> right, that live in the blood so, doing the same thing. So this paper is all about how the tyleria transforms Correct. the white blood cells. That's right. Transformation meaning will we'll divide forever. Correct. As long as the parasite places pressure on the cell. You know, cell. Dixon, if a cell is transformed and it divides enough, what yes. will happen next? Do you I know? believe you will die. No, no, no the, <laughs> cell, the, cell is, the cell won't die. It will live. No, you will die. The host will die from cancer. Ah, so cancer can result. That's what we would call that, so, uncontrolled cell growth. No, 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 it's different. 
Oh. Cancer and transformation are different. I want to make this very clear before we progress Please, here. go for it. All right. Transformation simply is a change in the cell's behavior, and one reflection of that is uncontrolled growth. Now, when a cell divides uncontrolled, it accumulates mutations. Oh. And after about 10 or 12 of the ones in the right proteins, in the right <laughs> genes, <laughs> including P53 and RB, etc., genes that control the cell cycle, and other genes, then you may become cancerous and cause a tumor. You'd call those oncogenes then, wouldn't you? Yeah, so being transformed is a step on the way to being a cancer, but okay. it's not okay. it, Not got every it. transformed no, cell will it. become a cancer got cell. It. So these guys never become cancers, do they? No. I, I guess they die at but some But there point. is an involvement of an oncogene, Yes, we'll get proto-oncogene. To that. Well, that's where the say. transformation... So the name oncogene, as you'll see, is a little bit of a misnomer. Yeah, it should it be, should be proto called, It should be called a transforming gene <laughs> maybe because it's only the first step on the way to Got being it. a cancer sure you know but but oncogenes were so named because of the tumor viruses that caused cancer and okay. they figured oh this explains it but it wasn't it's so r- what it's was wrong. the first cancer gene the first well the first <laughs> oncogene discovered yeah. was sark right in rouse sarcoma right. virus who also worked at rockefeller he did and he was able to transmit they a solid tumor other. of a chicken that's right by a virus exactly and it turned out 50 years later yeah. this virus by the way got three nobel prizes <laughs> one for rouse. the virus won a nobel prize yeah. one for rouse yeah. took 50 years for him to get his that's nobel prize true. that's true second for Tamman in baltimore who got reverse transcriptase right. from this virus and right. the third was bishop and varmus who discovered that. that this virus had picked up a gene from the host cell, and that's why it was able to transform got it, cells. Got it, got it. Transform, got not it. cause cancer. Got it. And they called it an oncogene. By the way, Harold Varmus is one of our most vaulted and that's right. venerated anyway, <laughs> graduates of our medical Sark, school. SRC, SARC, yes. an abbreviation of sarcoma, which that's was right. the kind of tumor yeah. that the chicken had. Yep. Sark is, yep. is part of the whole genetic pathway sure. that we're going to talk about today right okay so we're going to controls, dig into the molecules which controls mitosis lovely. cell division lovely okay. lovely this is under strict control in the cell you do not want cells to divide no. uncontrollably because they will become cancerous totally agree and this pathway that controls it is the mitogenic pathway and sark is part of that fantastic you, know, you don't seem to be so interested i, I if you could take a picture of my face right now, I'm astoundingly riveted to so the these, spot. So these uh, parasites go into a cell and they transform the cell. So the first thing they asked was, is there something secreted by the tylaria that ah. does this? Now, if, As a virologist, you wouldn't ask that question, would you? Because it's, it's, it's already the naked genome that you're interested in. No, this thing a good is, question. Their it's naked question. genomes are not exposed to the host here. So they have the sequence of the whole uh, genome of this They dye, do, right? they do. And so they did a they bioinformatic do. experiment, and they looked for proteins. So Dixon, if you wanted to see yeah. if you wanted to see something that might be secreted from a parasite, yes. what, what's, what would you look for in a gene that might confer that property well there's a sequence that results in the ability to secrete something. what's that called a leader sequence signal sequence okay so that's what you would look for i'd look for the leader sequence those, that's what gets proteins out of cells otherwise they true. stay inside this is very true and that's what they looked for you got it and they found 689 proteins in the tyleria genome that's a lot to choose from which could be, which were secreted. That's a lot. The, the next thing they did, yes, really clever. Yes, <laughs> they took another AP complexin <gasps> that does not transform. Be still my heart. Cells. And which one was that that uh, they T. took? T. Gandhi. T. Gandhi. Toxoplasma. Like toxoplasma. It's an AP complexin. It right? certainly is. They have the genome. They do. They say, and they compare all these six hundred eighty nine proteins. Right. And then. 33 weren't present in <gasps> T. Gondi. Oh, you've eliminated Pretty all good. That's not bad. A lot not less bad. work than 689. I'll say, I'll say. Ah, this is just beautiful. You I like love it. this. He likes this. And I haven't done any experiments <laughs> you don't yet. have to do any work and you get the answer, you sit at what your could computer. be better? <laughs> you sit at your computer and you do searches. Somebody did that work, though, to allow you to do that one. Dixon, you could walk in and say, the guy yeah, or the woman sitting at the computer, yeah. uh, search for all the signal sequences exactly. and then, then subtract out the T. That's Gondi. Right. I've seen this on Star Trek. <laughs> and then in an hour, they'd say, uh, Do- Professor de Pommier, we got 33 uh, genes. Okay. 
Now, what are the sequences of those? Well, that's the question. And so they um, they focused on the one that's the star of this paper, which yeah. is a protein called PIN1, and it is a peptidyl prolyl isomerase. Yes. What the hell does that mean? And I've been reading, so I can actually tell you what, what is that it? Stands for. Pro- I, I thought well, I, I thought actually I, Daniel's I thought been I educating me that because this is like the yeah, bio, you do that. You do, bio- do you like this? Do you like Go this for protein? it. Go for it. <laughs> Come on, Daniel. <laughs> I, I actually thought it was interesting um, because it is a little biochemistry. And uh, what, what what is a peptidyl prolyl isomerase, a PPI ACE? Right. And and we're going to get into signaling pathways, but I'm just going to talk about the biochemistry because uh, people are going to either have to remember their chemistry or right. they're going to have to, well, they're going to learn it. That's fine if you want to learn it. And I was trying to think, how, how do you explain this to people in a way that they can visualize? Because it's easy if you can draw it out. But chemicals... Um, have the ability to exist in what we call a cis and a transform. Oh. Okay. Some people remember that. For some people, it's new. <laughs> and if you think, if you, and I thought about how can I get to visualize this, think about a dog bone, right? <laughs> so you got, and your classic, like the cartoon dog bone, where it's, you know, the long shaft in the center, and then you've got the two knobs on the sides. Right. But now we're going to paint them colors. Oh. The ones on the top, they're both going to be red, right? <laughs> You so got they're, it. So they're both. And now look, they're on the same side, this cis side. Right. Now we're going to twist one end to the other side. But you now it's on the, the bone, opposite Daniel. side. Do you, do you like the bone? <laughs> they're going to somehow. Right. You're going to. And it's hard to twist a bone, right? This is right? an articulated bone. So we're well, going to try. You're going to try really <laughs> hard. Right. You know, yeah, and yeah, you, yeah. you get a couple friends. You now right. you've twisted it. Yeah. So there's a red on one side, and the other red is on the opposite side. You've so it's twisted. It's it. trans. And how do you remember that? Well, you uh, would need like transportation to get from the one to the other because now it's so far away. This is true. Um, so it's not cis. It's not on the same. But as we mentioned, it's really hard to twist that. And as soon as you let go, right, it's going to snap back. Oh, look at you. That's where our buddy comes in. Look at you. Right? The, um, and, but actually, in our, in our normal thing, they want to be trans. They want to be across from each other. Because? So now, because that is a low energy state. So now you've got your bone, and before you twist it and it's unpainted, you paint the top side is red on, on the left, and then the bottom side is red on the right. But now you're going to want to put them in this on the same side. You get twist really hard, but as soon as you let go, it's going to snap back. Sure. But our buddy, our, our isomerase, is going to hold it in that configuration. Uh, it's like a it's wrench. Gonna, it's going to drop the a molecular energy. Molecular wrench. And, and why do we care mm. about that? Well, we get into signaling pathways. We'll talk. But yeah. that's the biochemistry. The biochemistry yeah. is you want to okay. you want to have something that's going to help us with this energy hurdle and so, hold it in that cis configuration. All, all isomerases do this? Um, is that a general isomerase term? Isomerase is a name for changing a chemical bond in this way. Peptidyl prolyl is a specific one because proline, this is involving proline, this okay. weird... Right, no, no, it's not a acid, rotation. Right? So all isomerases change cis to trans? No, or no, trans to cis. It you could can be have a other cis things. Or trans to cis. It could be other properties, not just cis trans bonds. So they make an isomer. I mean, an isomer, right? Of isomer the normal is a broad name, right. Thing. Yeah. Okay, fine. But the peptidyl prolyl has this specific effect. We okay. don't know what is the target of this. We just know that it's there. And then the cool thing is there's a, a related tyleria called orientalis, which does not transform. They have this protein, but guess what it's missing? It's probably missing some amino acids no. that allow it to do this. No, it's missing something you told me before as when I asked you what helps proteins get out of cells. Oh, it's missing a so leader signal sequence. Signal sequence. Signal signal so sequence. this is a perfect candidate, right? Ah. A cell that doesn't transform. I mean, that's an association. It doesn't prove anything yet, so, but it can guide you. Is there a molecular uh, advantage to the other organism for not secreting this? Does it do something else in that That's organism? That's a good question. It doesn't transform. So obviously some tyleria can exist without transformation. So one might have been derived from the other. Which is what, it, in the end, they suggest that one evolved okay. from the other. Okay. Okay. And you can imagine it would only take a, a few mutations but it's to still, do that. But it still survives, though. It did. You how know, this is the beauty of Charles Darwin. So you're going to ask the question, then why <laughs> would, or how, what is the biological significance of the transformation if you can do it without it? Exactly. Ah. Exactly. Now we know where that question so came from. I understand why it's useful. Okay. However, this other guy, Tyleria orientalis, doesn't transform cells, right. and it apparently can infect whatever it's So the other is. two, parvum and uh, annulata, do. So they look at parvum, right? Right. 
right? Um, and annulata, right. So this protein is actually produced in cells. They have an antibody to it, and it's present in the cytoplasm and in the nucleus. So they have started with this big bioinformatic search, and now they have a candidate protein uh, that is getting into the host cell. Uh Uh-oh. All right, and so maybe this is good. They actually show that it has this biochemical activity, this peptidyl prolyl isomerase. They develop uh, an assay for it, and they show that this protein, in fact, has that activity. Hmm. They they also have a drug that um, is used to treat infections, right? Buparvaquone. <laughs> right. <laughs> Buparvaquone. It's, it's related to a tovaquone, yes? It's true. It used Trail. to treat, you treat cows with this who okay. are uh, infected. Okay. And it's really interesting. I mean, it's something that is stumbled into, is found to be effective, and it's actually interfering with this uh, yeah, isomerase. How lucky right can now. you get? <laughs> now when yeah, you, that's fishy. <laughs> <laughs> when you take this gene, PIN1, Yeah. And you overproduce it in a mammalian cell. Go on. In culture. What do you think happens to the mammalian cell? I would guess you get a transformation. Yeah, it keeps dividing. You transform them. Right. So, you know, in, in, in virology, often we want to make cells <laughs> live forever. Sure. So, for example, you'll take some... Uh, one of the things we do is get some uh, lung, f- lung cells and we grow rhinoviruses and we mm-hmm. want to immortalize them because we get them from patient samples. You don't mean each cell lives forever. You mean the culture lives forever. Is that right or not? What? what? Say that again. The age of each cell doesn't go on forever, but the culture no, does. No, they keep dividing. That's they the keep deal. keep dividing. Yeah, right? but the cell... Anyway, if you want to immortalize okay. cells, we go use uh, viral oncogenes, okay. telomerase, uh, which is another yes. way to immortalize cells. You could now do it with this PIN1. You can. It's actually an yes. immortalization gene. If it doesn't have any other toxic effects, because I can imagine isomerizing all your prolines might not be a good thing. <laughs> we don't know. So anyway, the, this pro- the gene encoding this protein will transform cells. Mm-hmm. So that is telling us it's probably important. Good right? stuff. Somewhere buried in here, they actually knock it down mm-hmm. and, uh, in a Tyleria-infected white blood cell and show that it's no longer transformed. I can't remember where that comes from. So this looks like it's the thing that, that is transforming the sure. cells. Sure, sure. Buparvaquone, we said, targets this protein. It inhibits the peptidyl pro- prolyl isomerase activity. Um, it, they also find in drug-resistant uh, animals the mutations are located in this protein. So the, the protein changes so that now with the drug bound to it, it still is active. So that, that explains drug resistance. That's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Now what is, what is PIN1 doing? That's the real question, right? Right. So it turns out that um, it's already been known that PIN1 targets a protein called FBW7. I know that rings a bell. <laughs> oh, God, not that one. <laughs> okay, Vincent, what do those these, things these, stand these, for? Uh, these, you know, actually, I don't know what the name stands for, but Uh-oh. I know what it does. This is a ubiquitin uh, ligase. I know ubiquitin ligase. Is it, do you like ubiquitin, Daniel? Do you want to explain <laughs> to people what ubiquitin does? I, I like ubiquitins. Um, we, we. Yeah. How do I? You how can do say I say the royal we. we? It's okay. So, <laughs> speaking as a cell, <laughs> there's a couple degradation pathways in cells, and the thing to realize about biological systems is, it's like that river, um, Heraclides. So you can only, and everything is constantly changing. Right. And we're making RNA, degrading RNA, making proteins, degrading proteins. Now the cell has developed a system for tagging certain proteins for degradation. Um, and it's ecological the, recycling yeah. at the mm. slow, cellular level. Yeah. You don't want to waste things. Nothing and, is wasted. Yeah, and well, yeah, and we don't destroy these proteins. We break them down into component parts, yeah, and then we, we, make build, a house we build new out stuff. Of bricks, you know? And then you take the bricks down and make another house. Mm-hmm. And so the ubiquitin system, things are tagged with Got ubiquitin, and, yep. and then they go through this ubiquitin degradation. Tagged with ubiquitin. Yes. Ubiqu- ubiquinated. So we produce something, a little molecule mm-hmm. that it sticks is onto it and says, I'm over here. It's, it's, and what do we what do we call something that sticks ubiquitin on? It's ligates it's ubiquitin. It's a ligase, yeah. ubiquitin and can, ligase. And that's what FBW7 is. You know, is. this is all simple when it's made knowledgeable. So right? FBW7 <laughs> so you, you, sticks ubiquitin onto other proteins. 
to degrade them. And we do that in cells because you don't want all proteins made all the time. No. Sometimes you make a protein briefly and you want to get rid of it, so you ubiquitinate mm -hmm. it. It's known that for, there are two pieces of information that these guys take advantage of. They're beautiful. One is that the transformation of these cells by Tyleria actually involves a cellular oncogene, or mm -hmm. what you call the proto-oncogene. Yes. See, June. All of these oncogenes, by the way, in the cell were discovered using retroviruses. Look at they that. Pick them up, like Look Sark was the first one, but oh. there were many others. Put them in a the whole They're cell. They're all part of the happens. mitogenic pathway. Got it. When you add growth factors to cells, they bind receptors, they transduce signals, and eventually in the nucleus, you make transcription factors that turn on genes that makes the cell divide. So there's this whole pathway. The whole pathway was discovered by transforming retroviruses. It's amazing. Sark, Mick, and there's another one. June. June. Right. Which happens to be a, a nuclear transcription. What does the J-U-N stand for? Uh, it's probably the name of the virus from which it came. Do you know? I don't. Let's look it up. Because I know that Mick stands for myeloblastosis, ah, for example. Okay. June is the uh, <laughs> sixth month of the year. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> June is busting out all over. <laughs> this is the problem when you get a, a dumb Google. See, June is a protein. Um, yeah, but what is I want to know what the virus yeah, exactly. name that it came from. Mm -hmm. uh, it was the transforming gene of avian sarcoma virus number 17. That doesn't explain it. No. Because, you know, when you sit around and you listen to people that are knowledgeable in this subject talk to each other, they're throwing out these initialed words like crazy because everybody knows what they stand for. And then you ask somebody, well, what does C. June stand for? Um, I don't have just learned it like that. Um, I don't know. Well, you know. Um, <laughs> and that's annoying, by the way. That's To a, a eukaryotic parasitologist, that's, you can't participate in the discussion because you don't understand the basis for the discussion. And that's. Yeah, no, that's I, I should know this because. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, I'm not accusing you of not knowing ones. it. I'm just saying that we tend to. To, to drift off into jargon to save time. And at this juncture, in our discussion of what's going on, we shouldn't try that. We should actually use the real words so that our listeners can keep up with us because we're trying to tell them something If Goff were here, I'd go out, he would know. You know, you know he would, he would. I've already done that. Yeah, he, he, he doesn't know it. He works on RNA you, tumor viruses. Well, but I've... He laughs every time I ask him a question like that. He says, so I don't know, I'd have to go one. back and look at my books. There's another one called Abel. Abel. Okay. ABL, but that was named after a guy who discovered the I knew virus. you knew that. Abelson. Okay, so Hox Box You know why I knew it? Because <laughs> Goff was at MIT with me, and Look he worked on Abel all Look the time. That. Look at so that. So that's why. Is that where you guys met, by the way? I didn't we know met that. at MIT. I had yes. no idea. So June is involved in the transformation of these cells by Tyleria. And right. guess what? FBW7 regulates the level of June through ubiquitination. Really? So, if you have cells meaning what? If you don't have FBW twelve in the cytoplasm with June, it doesn't work. If you don't have FBW seven, June is going to go crazy. Okay, it'll go crazy. So this will never be, protein it won't be tagged for degradation. Right. So never both be of them get over. tagged. Is that right? C June also. No, C June is being tagged. By, it's by being FBW7. ubiquitated. Oh. Actually, FBW seven you ubiquitated like itself. I but see the point. Yeah, the that's. Point. We don't have to worry <laughs> okay, about so that. to get rid of C June, you need FBW twelve. So, and, and let's and say you have a cell okay, in culture. You throw some growth factors in. Right. What that does, it turns up the amount of June in the cells right. divide. Right. But then, when the growth factor is gone, you want to get rid of the June. That's where FBW seven gotcha. comes in. Degrades it. So if you take away this. FBW seven. I would guess you would transform the cells if you took away FBW7. Well, the, basically what our PIN1 is doing is, yeah, is taking away. Yeah, somehow it's inhibiting the uh, ubiquitination activity. It's isomerizing it in the wrong direction. Of FBW7, so it doesn't uh, ubiquitinate June. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, how it happens is a good question, right? How? Yeah, and that's when you get to like the details of the signaling um, pathway, what exactly um, is happening. And sometimes each little step, it's subtle. But we do know that when you've got um, our PIN1, that you're going to have reduced FBW7. We'll say the ubiquitin ligase is down. And because it's down, CGEN isn't being ubiquitinated. It's not being targeted for degradation. It goes up. When it goes up, the cells go into cycle. There you go. Right. So that's how it works. Yeah. And they sort this out with very nice experiments. So you block sure. it. You block PIN1. 
restore things to the normal situation. Right. right. See June gets tagged, it gets degraded, and everything returns to its normal right. Very cool. state. If VW7 is controlling the levels of June, pin one <coughs> from Tyleria is inhibiting FBW7. So question. So if I'm a, a crazy. patient with cancer that's initiated by overregulation of or overexpression of C. June because I'm missing something that regulates its degradation. Are there drugs that can prevent that from happening and cure the cancer? I don't know of any. I mean, so you want theory. us to give you bupivacaine? <laughs> Is that what we're going to do? If in fact, <laughs> if in fact <laughs> that's no, the it's just a question because Bupar obviously you think about quote. these things. If if it's that well known, there should be so, some target. So C. June is a protein that we all make which yes. is essential for right. cells dividing right. you can imagine that if you sustain a mutation in it it may become oh, mutation in it. Oh, that's active different. in some way and you can't be ubiquinated and then you can't get rid of me- there could be many mechanisms right? Got it. there could be changes in okay. fbw7 there i'm not be. aware of of any that are linked to human cancers but i'm not a oncologist okay. Okay. so okay. we should ask okay. siddhartha mukherjee we should. But he wouldn't answer us. <laughs> no, and I, I was going you know to, I Googled it a little bit quick, quickly. I Googled it quickly, um, just because I remembered off. Um, so th- there's a whole pathway, the growth factor signaling pathway that's going to go through C-June, and upstream of that is the MAP-K and yep. JNK, yep. just to throw more acronyms <laughs> yeah. at everybody. Right. But there are some JNK inhibitors, um, and J is probably Janus kinase. Yeah. Um, so there are actually um, right. in clinical All trials right. Right. inhibitors that are targeting this pathway. Yeah, you see, but I can imagine they they have some toxicity ex- associated because they're going to hit the normal cells too that need this pathway yeah. anyway. True, so true. So that's why you'll need a virus that has the receptor for the protein on the surface of the cancer cell only to get that drug to the slow cells. So the, going back to Abel, this is a very interesting story. And, and I'm sure that Daniel will know this story. So the, the ABLE oncogene encodes a tyrosine kinase that's involved in signaling pathways. Okay. So a company developed an inhibitor of it called Gleevec. Yes. Which turns out to be incredibly useful for what kinds of there breast cancer? There are certain B-cell malignancies. B-cell malignancies, which nice. we, we would have predicted. So it's, it's a really good drug. Okay. Okay. It works really. And, you, and we learned this from... Molecular biology. Simple exploration at the molecular level. Gleevec. I mean, this what they found by just um, metadata analysis. Protein tyrosine kinase inhibitor. Right. That's how ABLE transforms nice. cells. Nice, nice, So I put a picture of this pathway, which is what I show my students, this whole growth factor, this mitogenic pathway, which has growth factors. So some retroviruses pick up growth factor genes and overproduce them as a way of transforming cells. Growth factor receptors, Herb B, FEMS, KIT, ROS, SCA, those are all growth factor receptors and the genes are picked up by transforming re- retroviruses. Then membrane bound protein kinases include SARC and that's uh-huh. the one that sor- browse sarcoma virus. Right. Mm. So you know retroviruses make a DNA copy of their genome and they integrate this DNA into the genome of the cell. And sometimes when it, when the RNA is made, it picks up neighboring sequences. And if that happens to be a cellular proto-oncogene, then the virus will have Because they're integrated randomly exactly. throughout the genome. Got it. No retrovirus Got it. needs to transform to Got reproduce. It. Got it. Yeah. It's an accident. But this one does. And it is, it is neat that we're actually Apparently. looking at pathways that are clinically relevant. You know, sometimes you say, oh, this is a veterinary journal. We're, we're learning how to treat. <laughs> yeah, the uh, veterinarians would know. be stymied by a, even the simple is, words. But no, the idea they're not trained like that. <laughs> <laughs> they're really not. No, this but as we a, mentioned with Gleevec and, you know, the, yeah, the yeah, CML, yeah, Philadelphia yeah, pos- yeah, positive yeah, yeah. Um, malignancy, it actually, some of the stuff, understanding sure. these pathways sure. is clinically relevant. Yeah. I'll, I mean, I'll modify my statement just now. All the great vet schools have great researchers that are doing work at this level that do understand all of this, but, but most practicing cool here vets is do that not this, do this. We understand how this growth control pathway works, and this is important for cancer treatment now. We yeah. understand because we studied retroviruses of chickens mm-hmm. and mice and Look at you. Uh, cats. Yeah. All these things which you're not allowed to do anymore. Oh, I, mean, I shouldn't say we're not allowed. Oh, you just can't get money to we're do not, it. You just we, it's very to difficult to do this. You'd have to move to another research. country. <laughs> I, other countries understand the importance of yeah, doing that's it. right. That's exactly right. The last sentence of this paper, I think this is a gorgeous paper. <laughs> Evolution of a PIN1 homologue 
with an acquired signal peptide only in T. annulata and T. parva provides a fascinating insight into, into how apicomplexins have hijacked oncogenic pathways to maintain host cell transformation. So, yeah, they have some don't transform and some do. So it works both ways. So you got a crossover paper here. So, Dixon, that's the thing. When you ask why questions, it's not, it's not good because <laughs> right. they both work, right? That's correct. And what you, you said, what's the biological is, significance? Exactly. This is a beautiful paper. Yeah, this great. This is very nice. Okay. I loved it. I really okay. enjoyed it. Cool. Buparvaquone. <laughs> There's another jug, <laughs> drug they use here called Juglone. <laughs> Juglone? <laughs> I just have this picture of a jug. Huh? <laughs> or a jugular Did you like injections? this paper, uh, Daniel? You know, I thought it was a great paper. And I think, and to echo what you're saying, is the reason they could do this work is they were standing on top of all this basic science that has gone on. You know, instead, you say, oh, this is so obvious. Look, they looked at the signaling yeah. sequence. <laughs> how, did we know, how did we know how to do bioinformatics signaling sequence? <laughs> and then they compare it to toxoplasma. Oh, we have right. that sequenced, and we can do that. And then they understand this pathway. They find this homologue, and they say, you know what? That sequence, that is homologous to PIN1, which we've studied. Right. And so it was great. And I think just another reason why you need to do the basic science. You need to explore this stuff. Here, here. You can't just say, I'm going to cure cancer Tuesday. Wait a minute. Because you need the basic understanding. Isn't that to know why what we're doing even... this podcast? This yeah, is the is. basis for the podcasting. Yeah. yeah we are part, disseminating sure. basic knowledge. For sure. But more people need to disseminate their knowledge. That's the key. So we want them to pass this on. Yeah, I wish they would. See, the for thing is that Daniel put it, it, hit it right people. on the head. You can't say, I want to cure cancer. You have to do basic That's science. That's right. Right? I mean, you have a certain amount of, yeah, we have to cure this, yeah. but not 100%. And that's unfortunately what NIH is, is trending towards. They're forgetting all these Even the National systems. Cancer Institute? Don't they fund basic research? No, they, they've turned away from model systems really? as well. It's that's, all that's very a translational. That's a shame. Anyway, well, let's, let's... I'll infect, bet we have a case this Let's week. infect another person. <laughs> Great. We do have a case. All right. If we still have anyone listening, we have a case. <laughs> I know, we go on with these now. We used to be very short. Now we... we well, now we're long. <laughs> and this is another recent case. Um, which is great. I mean, I, I initially when we talked about what, it, and when something interesting comes in, and and I think it's going to help with uh, understanding and remembering a certain aspect of parasitism. Um, I am happy to present. So here's a 33 year old woman from El Salvador. She immigrated to the U.S. about 10 years ago, and she arrived at the ER. All right. So she's been in this country for 10 years. Came here when she was 23. We got it already. You already know. I'm just. <laughs> <laughs> We just want to throw people off. <laughs> well, you, you might think you have it, and then I'll tell you some stuff, and you might say, hmm, how about that? Um, no, because in a sense, uh, okay, let me just continue with Please the HBI. Continue. I'm interrupting myself. <laughs> and she comes into the ER with the acute onset of generalized shaking and loss of consciousness. So the story is this. 6.30 a.m., she let out a yell dropped to the floor with shaking of all her extremities, biting of her tongue, loss of urine. Um, she was confused, a little disoriented. Um, the family thought, oh, well, she's better now. But then it recurred at 5.30 p.m. So at this point, they thought we should probably get her to the ER. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right. So I she, don't know why. That sounds like an episode on Grey's Anatomy. <laughs> Yes, so she so she came to the ER, and I'll give everyone a little more information. Yeah, they went through past medical history. She has a history of high blood pressure. Yeah, um, no how high? <laughs> <laughs> it is uh, well controlled on hydrochlorothiazide. So one thirties, eighties. Um, oh. I think she's one forty over ninety. Is this actually, one of your cases, see her. by the way. Yeah, this was just recent. L local. This was yes, Long okay. Long Island. Okay. Um, <clears throat> No surgeries. We say as far as allergies, I love this. She's allergic to penicillin. When she gets penicillin injections, it causes pain. <laughs> <laughs> that's not an allergy. Sorry. Oh, oh, it's not? <laughs> no, it's an aversion for pain. <laughs> but that's what was recorded. Oh, uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> dear, dear, dear. Um, no, I, I think that it, it, I always, that'll, that'll be my little uh, soapboxing. When someone says they're allergic to penicillin, keep asking. What do you right, mean? Right. What do you mean by that? I don't Allergic like. I don't like the taste. I had trouble swallowing <laughs> right. the pill. Um, exactly. 
Okay. And the family history, she she doesn't seem to know um, of any particular <laughs> diseases in the family. Um, keep, keep talking. She she cleans houses. She lives with her <laughs> husband, and they have a one year old uh, son. Um, she doesn't report any drinking or, as we say, toxic habits. Um, she grew up, as I mentioned, in El Salvador, in rural El Salvador. But this she might, lives here in the U.S. now, she right? li- For 10 years, she's lived okay, here in, in the U.S. 10 years. Um, and then I'll throw, I'll throw this in. I'll throw this in. She says no pets currently. And she makes a point. She says that um, she doesn't eat meat. She says the only meat she's Does ever not eat eaten meat? is chicken. She's not a meat uh, eater. She only eats um, chicken? <laughs> I love that. No, she, she hasn't even eaten much chicken. Okay. She basically says that right. meat's too expensive, right. so right. she really never eats it. It's not like she has any kind of um, ethical issue with meat. Sure. Um, and on very rare occasion has she eaten chicken. Right. Mm. Anybody else in her family? Well, yes, remember, she lives with her husband, one-year-old child, and they have a lot of, um, you know, friends, Extended relatives sense. from, Extended you know, that so have do other people migrated up from El Salvador. Um, I'm sure they do. I'm just, so I am, too. You, you, uh, saw but her, her family in? doesn't, you know, doesn't have a lot of money, so they they don't. They live in rural. They lived in rural. Now they're living on Long Island. Ten years ago. Uh, yeah, yeah, Ten years yeah, ago. As you know, it. Dixon, that's too long for anything to have carried you think? over. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, 10 years yeah. is propitious. So you... Yeah. Um, and remember, these are... I'm giving you guys real cases. So they, yeah, often no, no, often no. I find out that the patients don't read the textbooks. <laughs> so they're, they're that's presenting... True, that's true. That's true. And so, when you saw her in the ER, she was febrile or not? She was 100.3. So okay. her temperature yeah. was a little over 100. Um, she initially, after the events, is confused for a while, but then she clears. Um, blood pressure 140 over 90, heart rate 90, respiratory rate 16. Um, right. As far as her exam. Um, yes, let's talk about that. Completely non focal. So we're not finding any weakness. It's no swollen livers. No swollen livers. No, no, no big spleens. No rashes. Keep lungs talking. are clear. Um, good vision out of both eyes. Good vision out of both eyes. Good fundoscopic exam. No sign of hypertension? Um, she was 140 over 90, but in yeah. the back of the eyes, yeah, you're not seeing AV nicking or any of the other <laughs> hallmarks. Right. Um, and labs, her white mm. count is elevated at 11,000, but there's no left shift or band forms. Should we talk about what that means? You can do that if you'd like. Um, and this will be helpful for the non-physicians. There's, we're trying to decide in someone who had a seizure if the elevated white count, which is typical of a seizure, is in response to a cortisol demargination, so you still have the normal distribution of white cells, they've just demarginated, they've come off the um, the margins of the vessels, or whether this is someone who is responding to an infection, an acute infection, mm-hmm. where you start seeing an increase in number of poly- polymorphonuclear cells. And she did not have an increase in polymorphonuclear She didn't have the left shift, so the white count was a little right. bit up. So I'm going to sort of say- shift, I'm, <laughs> yeah, she had no left shift. And by left, yeah, you know, tell, us, sort of, tell us what that means. You know, why do we say left? It's because that's how they report. So polymorphonuclear leukocytes get reported first as the highest number, and that number goes up in a left shift. Well, I was taught here. And what would band forms be? <laughs> well, when you're yeah. producing a lot of inflammatory cells, yeah. the cells will actually come out of the marrow right. into the peripheral circulation right. at an earlier developmental right. stage. Right. When, that's if right. you look under the microscope, they actually, um, instead of having the... It's usually three lobes to the nucleus. Yeah. They'll have a band form right. to the That's nucleus. Right. That's right. And they usually depict these things pictorially with the most immature cell to the far left, mm-hmm. <laughs> the next most immature form in the middle, and the immature form in the right. So if they say shift to the left, <laughs> I always remembered it saying, yeah, they've got more immature cells, and therefore they're coming at it at an earlier stage because they're really needed. They're calling out uneducated troops, basically. They haven't had basic yeah. training. Right. So, <clears throat> okay. So, and would you have called this episode that this woman experienced don't as a it, seizure? Don't give it away. So, was it a seizure? Um, well, let's let's look look at that because that's one of the questions here um, because that helps us classify. This. She has a loss of consciousness, mm-hmm. and clinically, we try to make this distinction between syncope and a seizure. 
and some of the distinguishing features between the two. Syncope might be for some reason you're not getting adequate blood supply to your head. Let's say you have an arrhythmia or something like that. Then you'd have syncope. And um, in that case, the person might drop to the floor. Sometimes there is some shaking, particularly I've seen in some ventricular rhythms where there, there can be some shaking. Um, they usually won't bite their tongue. They usually, usually will not lose or release urine or stool. And then when they do wake up, very quickly they're oriented, orientated. Um, right, people who have seizures, there tends to be a lot more muscular activity, um, biting of a tongue, loss of urine or stool. And then there's a period of time um, which go on for several minutes where they continue to be disoriented and confused. And so I describe this woman as losing urine, biting her tongue, and actually having a period of confusing confusion after the event. So you would call that a seizure? I would call that a seizure. Okay. And her history, she didn't have any unusual history as far as she told you, right? No, she really was healthy up until um, these events. And she doesn't remember anything happening in uh, El Salvador years ago, no fevers or anything like that? You know, it's interesting. We always say normal childhood <laughs> illnesses, but, you know, she had diarrhea, she had fevers she as had a malaria. kid. She didn't, yeah, she didn't describe anything yeah, out sure. of the ordinary relative to her. Okay. Yeah, but ordinary there is different from yeah, ordinary, ordinary here. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> okay. Very interesting. Got it. So that's all you're going to give us. Now. That's all you're going to get. That's all we're going get to get. Think. And I think that's, that's enough all we for need. people that's to think need. about no, it. I that's, think we're okay. That's yeah. the teaser. That is the... Uh, the teaser for the movie to follow. I think people <laughs> will uh, rapidly be able to figure this out. Perhaps. <laughs> Perhaps. Perhaps. <laughs> now, Remember, she doesn't um, eat meat. Yeah, so that, that is important to think about, whether that impacts your um, diagnosis. Right. All right. Should we... Um, I think we should wrap it, because we're at two hours. We do have a lot of emails, so at some point in the future... We'll do an email. We should do an episode with case and email. How's that? would that? be great. No paper. Maybe make that the next one. Because we have a bunch of e- emails uh, accumulated that I would like to read. Sure. Some of them... All of them, of course, are wonderful. They are. And um, That means they're listening, right, Vincent? People are listening. And they're paying attention, and they're writing intelligent letters about things they've heard about before we are approaching our one millionth download i love it that's a big number i love that that is we need to have a party when we hit <laughs> yeah, exactly i wonder right. if it'll coincide with our hundred <laughs> <laughs> for our hundredth maybe we should go well, we're gonna have somewhere. steak tartare we're gonna have steak tartare for the hundredth come on <laughs> we should go into the woods and sit in a malaria infested place or mosquito infested place and have uh, you uh, think <laughs> you live yeah, your science is that what yeah, it is yeah <laughs> exactly live the podcast right well i don't think so we could demonstrate our commitment we could just just like that uh, <laughs> right i don't think so this episode is number 88 which happens to be the number of keys on a piano? It's exactly right. What was your... What Ebony you and Ivory is one of those titles, or... We could... That'd be one of them. Ebony and like Ivory. That. I like And then that. there was the French Foreign Legion. French that's Foreign Legion. Too. That's right. That's the name of the song played on the piano. <laughs> right. This episode and all the others are free for your consumption. Always free. You can find them at iTunes and at microbeworld.org slash twip. Of course, if you have a podcatcher on your... Uh, mobile device you can get lots of download lots of apps to listen to podcasts as well we're everywhere right dixon we are just like chicken man we are everywhere chicken is everywhere chicken man you don't know what that series chicken it man? was a boston no. radio show <laughs> called chicken man i don't watch tv chicken man chicken man he's everywhere he's everywhere good voice you don't know you that, should do sir? voiceovers my son does voiceovers <laughs> oh, <laughs> i yes. taught him how <laughs> if you have questions or comments you should send them to twip at twiv.tv Daniel Griffin is at Cornell University. Ha, ha, ha. No, I'm at Columbia. I'm at Columbia. You went to NYU. Cor- you know, was Cornell, never Cornell. Cornell is that other member of the sports Some league. Some kind of uh, <laughs> words just come out. I know they're wrong. Columbia University Medical Center, which is, in fact, where we are. Thank you, Daniel. Indeed, indeed. Oh, nice to be here. Dixon de Pommier is at trichinella.org. Thank you, Dixon. Pleasure, pleasure, pleasure. And I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. The music you hear at the beginning and the end of TWIP is composed and performed by Ronald Jenkins. You can find his work at ronaldjenkins.com. You've been listening to This Week in Parasitism. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another TWIP is, is parasitic. parasitic.